Okay, uh, good uh, morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here for the first session of the day. Um, so my name is Anir Banpal. I'm an assistant professor at West Texas A&M University and uh, in mechanical engineering. And I happen to use uh, high performance computation in my research. Um, and I'm also sort of uh, introduced or at least acquired through an NSF grant, uh, a high performance cluster at our university. It's a, like our first uh, HPC cluster. And so I'm also uh, trying to make sure that the cluster is used or um, I'm trying to assist uh, researchers on campus to get and try to use the cluster. So I'm also wearing the hat of sort of a quasi HPC admin. Um, so this is how I got introduced to SPAC because I wanted to make sure that uh, softwares that are available to researchers uh, are easily accessible uh, to researchers and, and student users. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about SPAC. And after that, I'll tell you how this fits in uh, with the, within the context of this entire workshop that you are uh, participating in. Um, so first thing uh, I would like to, let me go ahead and share my screen before so I'm gonna go ahead and Share my screen and this is the link that you should all have access to on the zoom chat if you don't have it i will paste it again um, so so spac is basically a, a, a package management tool uh, that is designed to support multiple versions and configurations of software on a wide variety of platforms and environments so this is basically the first line um, so and it is designed for supercomputing centers such as the one you have at your at the university of arizona uh, but typically a lot of the largest uh, computing clusters are using SPAC to manage the applications that are available to them. Um, so uh, a simple example would be, um, let's say if you're familiar with some kind of the Linux command line, which is sort of a prerequisite for this, uh, for this uh, session today, uh, you might have used, let's say, apt or yum or, or some kind of a tool that you install uh, softwares with on your on your machine and uh, sometimes uh, you know you need uh, pseudo privileges uh, to install these packages um, and sometimes even with pseudo privileges you cannot install the package you have to download the source tar file and then you have to unzip it uh, or untar it and then you have to build it uh, compile it link it and then finally install it so it, it can be a really complicated process, especially if you're dealing with uh, really large soft, uh, software packages. Uh, for example, if you're trying to install TensorFlow, uh, unless you're using something like Anaconda, uh, installing TensorFlow can be challenging, even on your own personal laptop. Um, so you know, when you're using your own personal computer, uh, installing software is challenging, but you can still manage to do it. If you're installing it on an HPC, uh, then it becomes really, really challenging because first of all, you probably don't have root privileges, right? So you have to install, make sure everything is installed in your home directory. Um, and uh, secondly, if, this, if the package is sufficiently complicated, uh, you might end up spending a good portion of your uh, time that you thought you would be doing research in, in installing the package. So, I mean, as a researcher, when I was doing a PhD, uh, there will be times then that I would spend a week or two uh, just installing a software package that I that I need uh, for my research, and, and a lot of the time uh, this is a skill that is not often appreciated because all you're doing is just installing something on your cluster, right? So you can't write that on your CV like, "Hey, I'm an expert in installing this particular version of this particular software on this particular computer." It's a very very narrow skill. Um, so uh, considering all these challenges with installing software. Uh, this is where SPAC comes in. SPAC uh, really, really makes it easy, um, uh, uh, makes software installation or package installation on HPC computers, uh, it makes it really accessible uh, to researchers. Um, and it's a relatively new tool. Um, it is, it's still in its uh, 0.16 version, so it's, it hasn't in, uh, hit its version 1 yet, but it's still very, very good, even as it's uh, such a nascent stage. Um, so uh, most importantly that I would say this SPAC is very, very simple to use. So if you've used any kind of uh, Conda, if you've used Anaconda in the past, it's almost as easy as using Anaconda to install packages or YUM or apt. It's, it's very similar structure. Uh, it's often, it's also more sophisticated in that it offers a lot more options when you're installing a certain package. Um, so 
Uh, this is, and it's uh, based in Python. It's a language that uh, I'm guessing most of you, or at least uh, some of you will be sort of familiar with. Um, so there's a lot of familiarity with this. And uh, so the prerequisites for this workshop is gonna be, I'm gonna assume that you have some familiarity with the Linux command line. So if you have a computer uh, with Linux on it that you have access to, so it can be uh, your own computer or it can be an HPC computer that you have access to, then you can sort of follow through this workshop as I'm going along. Uh, I think that would be the ideal way you can attend this workshop. Um, otherwise you can just fall, just look at what I'm doing and uh, uh, try to uh, glean as much information as you can. But uh, a much better way of uh, doing this workshop would be to do as I type these commands out. So there's gonna be a list of commands that we're gonna go through. Uh, the best way for you to learn will be to use these commands and run it as I'm running it on your own machines. Um, so I just wanted to make sure, uh, Austin, are you still here? Yep, I'm here. I was just wondering, uh, do these do, do the attendees have some access? I didn't. I, I know I didn't ask for this specifically, but uh, do they have access to some Linux machines or some computers that they can access, or they're just they, on their own? They should, if they're attending this, have it on their own computer, have, use okay. a virtual machine or something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so if you have a Linux virtual machine, you can just use that. Okay. Thank you, Esther. Okay. Um, so, so one of the small, uh, really interesting things that uh, I like to quote uh, for this uh, in, in some context, and this is certainly applicable for this workshop. Um, so the history of every major galactic civilization uh, tends to pass through three distinct phases, uh, survival, inquiry, and sophistication, uh, or known as the who, why, how, why, or where phases. For example, the first phase is characterized by the question, how can we eat? The so second, why do we eat? And the third, where shall we have lunch? Uh, so this is from uh, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe. It's a fantastic book by Douglas Adams. Uh, so SPAC actually offers you the survival inquiry and sophistication in the business of building scientific packages. So you will not only know how to build scientific packages, packages but you'll also see uh, there's a lot of sophistication that you can do in terms of building scientific packages that you may not have uh, thought of before. Um, so uh, how does how does this uh, workshop fit in with the rest of the um, let's say uh, the the Respas, uh enterprise? So Respas, you'll be learning you know how to do data science, how to do Python, how to do visualization, and, and there are a whole uh, list of workshops uh, that are available. Uh, introduction to R, Bayesian analysis. So a lot of these are actual skills that you'll be using to do your research. Uh, SPAC, uh, SPAC is going to be sort of one of those uh, skills that you will need, but probably something that you may not be able to put on your CV. But it, again, as I mentioned, it's a skill that you'll need to make sure that you can do your research. So if you look at uh, Blake's uh, declassified HPC survival guide, so you can think of SPAC as being a part of the survival guide. Okay, so you know, being able to use an HPC and being able to install softwares on HPC that will aid your research, uh, that's what that's where SPAC. Okay, uh, so uh, just to rewind and repeat why you want to use SPAC, you know, compiling, linking, and building packages on HPC systems can be very challenging. As I mentioned, it can take weeks, uh, or sometimes you might just give up, right? Sometimes uh, you, you can have cases where you're installing uh, some quantum chemistry software or some molecular dynamics software, and it depends on a certain library, which is not available, and sometimes you install that library. And even then it doesn't compile. So it can be a lot of challenging questions. Uh, so you can have a dependency on a package uh, that has been compiled with a different compiler. So for example, let's say you're installing a package or compiling a package with uh, uh, new C++, but the dependency that's already on the machine that has been compiled with an older version of GCC or, uh, or let's say CLang. Okay, so, so uh, that may not work. Um, or you can have a dependency that has that is very old and the package that you're installing now requires the latest version of the dependency. And these dependency structures can be really complicated, right? So you can have uh, something like, uh, even something like OpenMPI that can have seven or eight different dependencies. And so what do you do? Do you make sure, you have, then you have to make sure that you install all the dependencies before you install OpenMPI. Otherwise, you cannot install OpenMPI. Or if you're installing something like some LAMPS or Abinit or some kind of quantum chemistry software, 
uh, or even data analysis software such as TensorFlow that will require some Python dependencies that you have to install first before you can install TensorFlow. Uh, so SPAC is something like a one-shot solution that takes care of everything for you. You do not have to go into uh, the nitty gritties of compiling all the dependencies before you compile the final package. SPAC will take care of that. It's, it's very similar to let's say a Conda install or an Anaconda, if you're familiar with that, it takes care of the dependencies. Okay, so with respect to the workshop, uh, I wanna make sure that you have these requirements. So you wanna have some version of Python. I, I, I mentioned here Python 3, but even if you're using Python 2.7, this will still work. Uh, of course, Python 2.7 is no longer supported as of 2021. So I would suggest you to migrate to Python 3 as soon as you can. Uh, you should have a new C, C++ compiler on your virtual machine or in your Linux uh, terminal. Uh, you should have access to GNU, new make, uh, and you should have access to some of these commands such as wget, unzip, git, curl, uh, any of these. So you should be able to download some packages from the internet. Uh, so these are all the requirements that are required for today's workshop. Um, now, before we get started, I just wanted to uh, <laughs> figure out if you have any questions. Uh, I, I've given a lot of information. I haven't asked you to do a lot of things yet, but I just wanted to get a feel of where you are um, and if you have any questions before we even get started. And if you have questions, you can put it in chat or you can ask it verbally. Um, we'll be using pre-built SPAC things. Uh, so first question is from Devin. Um, uh, will we be using pre-built SPAC things or making our own from scratch? We will be making our own from scratch. Uh, so that's it, okay? So we are starting uh, uh, assuming that you do not have any SPAC on your computer or on your machine. If you do, then that's totally fine, uh, but we're gonna start from scratch. Uh, you just need to have these four requirements. Um, and if you don't have wget, uh, there's a way in which you can just download it using Firefox or something like that. Okay, so let us go ahead and begin. And uh, this is my own uh, Linux machine that I'm gonna be using. And I hope you can see my uh, command window over here. I'm gonna increase the font size a little bit. Uh, okay, and hopefully you can see this now. So this is what I have here. And I'm gonna basically go through uh, the first four commands um, under item one. So that's what uh, we are gonna be doing right now. So I would suggest uh, you know, either copy pasting these commands. So the first command is basically downloading SPAC uh, from the GitHub. So if you look at uh, the GitHub SPAC, oops, let me move this to the right here. So the GitHub for SPAC is this, and this contains all the all the packages, uh, all the SPAC packages. Uh, but we're not going to be downloading all of it. We're just going to be downloading uh, this zip file. So I'm just going to copy paste uh, the zip file into a directory that I want to work with. So I'm going to work with this with my software directory over here, and I'm just going to paste this first line over here, and I'm just going to download uh, that zip file. And if you do not have wget, uh, you can just copy this link and put it in your browser and just press enter. Uh, that should also help you uh, just download it uh, using uh, the Firefox save file option. So you can do either wget or you can just download it using Firefox. Okay, so once you download it, uh, you should be able to see this zip file. Um, in your folder. Uh, this is the 0.16.1 version. As I mentioned, SPAC is still in its infancy and you'll be amazed at what it can do even in its infancy. It's a, it's a prodigious child. Okay, so once I have uh, downloaded this, uh, did anybody have trouble downloading the zip file? Um, did anybody have any success? Both questions are important. I just want to get a feel of uh, if anybody is uh, following along or if I'm going too fast. 
if you've downloaded it, you should be able to see the zip file uh, when you, let's say, list the contents of the directory where you downloaded it in. Uh, okay, uh, let me move forward and I'll, and I'll come back um, once this step is done. So once you've downloaded this, uh, just go ahead and unzip uh, the zip file. Yes, did anyone have a question? Um, did you want to use the yes or no reactions? Is this uh, from the downloading? Let's see. So if you, you just save the file. Um, I would say yes. I'm, I'm not really sure what the context is, but if you just do unzip the zip file, um, just say yes and it should be able to unzip uh, the zip file and create a folder called SPAC 0.16.1. And hopefully this is easy to read. Okay, so now you should have a SPAC. Oh, yes, uh, Devin, yeah, just, just say, just use complete sentences. So if you had an issue, you can just say yes. I have an issue or you can say, yes, I succeeded. <laughs> you can provide context. I know I'll be asking a uh, hundred questions, uh, but you can just answer uh, if you succeeded or you failed. And I can try to either pitch in and assist or, okay, great. So you have a SPAC folder here. Okay, so we have gone through the first step. And finally, this is like a really important step uh, this step is something that we have to follow to make sure that the SPAC commands, we can run them. So if you if I do SPAC, if I just type enter SPAC here, it's going to say command SPAC not found, okay? So just downloading SPAC is not going to help us run SPAC. So we want to make sure uh, that we can run SPAC, which means I have to um, add the location of this uh, SPAC package, wherever that is, to the environment variables. And the way to do that is we're going to copy this command. So we are going to do source uh, share spac setup environment. So this is a shell script that basically adds uh, this pack directory to your path variable. And so when you source this directory, you will immediately be able to run spac command. So now if I run spac, you, you will see that it recognizes that SPAC is a command uh, and it tells you that it's a flexible package manager that supports multiple versions, configurations, platforms, and compilers. Uh, so, so once you've done these four steps, you should be able to run the SPAC command or you can just do SPAC help uh, to get some information on the SPAC command. So if you've completed step one, you should be able to run SPAC after that. Is anybody having any trouble uh, for the first step? Okay. All right. So now we have uh, run. We have kind of sort of installed SPAC. Although technically it's 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 not technically installed, but SPAC is now available to you. Let's just say that. And the inter interesting thing about this is we have downloaded SPAC, we have unzipped SPAC, we can run SPAC commands, and none of this required any root privileges. So you could have done this um, even in your uh, login node on your HPC cluster. So, so again, this is something that is available to everyone. It's not something that requires root privileges or even talking to your HPC admin. You can just do this on your own. All right, so now I have SPAC available to me. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say SPAC list. So the second step here that we're going to uh, uh, follow along is listing all the packages in SPAC. So if I do SPAC list, it's going to take a while, but it's going to list all the packages that are available to me to install using SPAC. So you can think about this as a, as a repository. Okay? So SPAC list is, has a, is a repository of all the softwares or all the packages uh, that are available. And it's going to be a little hard to read. Let me run this command again. I'm just going to write SPAC list. And you will see a huge list of packages that can be installed in SPAC. 
So let me uh, uh, mention a few key ones. So you can see siesta here. If you know uh, quantum chemistry, now I'm, I happen to be involved in quantum chemistry simulations. So I can easily uh, figure out, you know, siesta, that is, that is a package used for quantum chemistry. Again, not easy to install. Uh, then you have symmetrics. If you do any kind of meshing, symmetrics is a tool that can be very useful in that context. If you have uh, looked at, you know, installing uh, containers in HPC systems, you might have come across the word singularity. It's like the Docker equivalent in the, on an HPC system. Uh, so you have a lot of packages here. You will also notice that, you know, you have the, you have Python TensorFlow. You can see all these Python tools and you can see Python TensorFlow. So you can install uh, Python TensorFlow using SPAC. Um, you get, you also have LAMPS. LAMPS is a package that I use for molecular dynamics, and you can see that listed as well. LAMPS is again something that's not too hard to compile, but in certain contexts, it can be a little hard to compile. Um, so SPAC can also help you with that. Um, you also have like Julia, you can install R uh, using SPAC. Uh, so you can see a bunch of a whole bunch of R based packages. So if you're doing a lot of research using Python or R, you can use SPAC to install all of these packages. So SPAC list is basically listing all the packages that are available in SPAC. And it's a pretty good list. And if this list is hard to read, you can always go to the SPAC website. So SPAC package lists, if I just Google SPAC package list, it's going to list all the packages that are available um, in SPAC, uh, basically the same information um, that you saw earlier in the command window. It's now in your HTML browser. Okay. All right. So, so now we have some information on. Now we at this point we have sort of uh, how frequently are these packages updated? That's a good question, um, uh, Lynn. If I'm pronouncing your name right, uh, the packages are. I do not have uh, inside information on this. I'm afraid I'm, I'm simply a user. Uh, but at least with the packages that I am interested in, um, I have found that they are uh, pretty well updated. So if you have a package uh, that's been released today, there's a good chance if it's and if it's maintained by SPAC, there's a good chance it's going to be available in SPAC within a month let's say. And sometimes if you have a package that is available, but not in SPAC, uh, you can reach out to uh, the, the SPAC folks and uh, they'd be happy to either add that repository uh, uh, to, their, uh, to their repository. Okay, so uh, they, they're very cooperative. They are very good and quick at answering to requests. Uh, so you can always uh, get, get directly, get in touch with the SPAC folks, uh, especially Todd Gamblin. Okay, so, so now you should be able to list all the packages that are available in SPAC. Uh, now let's just, let's just get some information about this package. Okay. So one package that you might be interested in, at least I am interested in is OpenMPI because anytime you're running uh, you know, infra programs on a supercomputer, you wanna make sure that you have uh, good MPI libraries available. And the common MPI libraries are MPitch and OpenMPI. Um, but there could be other packages, but let's just look at some information about the open MPI package and let's see what this command gives me. So I'm going to look at SPAC info open MPI and you will see I get a bunch of information here. So it, uh, it tells me what open MPI is. Uh, it tells me, you know, what's the website uh, for the homepage. Uh, it gives me a list of safe versions. So you can see there are a lot of versions available. Um, and the latest version um, that the uh, SPAC offers is 4.0.5. Uh, let's see if that is actually the latest version. So I'm going to paste it here. So if I go to the OpenMPI website, let's see. The website is actually still open or they changed it. Maybe this is an old website, let's see, open MPI, download. So the current latest version is 4.1.1 and that's April 24th, 2021. 
they don't have 4.1.1 yet. So this is a kind of situation where you want to reach out uh, to uh, the SPAC folks and say that, hey, this latest version is available here, uh, but it's not in SPAC yet. Could you add that? Okay. But you can see it's it's still pretty well maintained. And uh, so for most purposes, it's, it's still very good. Okay, uh, you will also see something called a preferred version. Um, so this is the version that gets installed if you do not specify what version you want to install. Um, and it also lists all the dependencies that uh, OpenMPI can have. Uh, some of these are going to be compulsory dependencies. Some of these are going to be optional dependencies. So for example, uh, Luster, uh, that is only going to be a dependency if your computer is using the Luster file system. Uh, Java is going to be a dependency uh, if, if you want to build OpenMPI with Java support and so on. So most of the times these dependencies are going to be inactive, uh, but in some cases they will be active. So for example, static is going to be always on, although static is not a dependency, it's just a, a specification. Um, and uh, VT, that's a vampire trace support that is also on. And you can see VT also listed in some places. Okay, so this is what SPAC info uh, will give you. It will give you information about the package. And we can also get, uh, if you just want to see what versions are available, instead of getting all this detailed information, I can just do SPAC versions open MPI. And that's going to list all the versions that are available. So you can see that the safe versions are the ones that are listed here. They have all been checksummed, which means they have been verified. And there are some remote versions that have not been uh, checksummed. So if you know about checksum, checksum is a way to verify whether the package is uh, safe to use, so to speak. Um, so if it's not yet checksummed, it means that it, it might still be safe to use. It has just not been verified. So for example, you can see that one of the non-checksummed versions, it's actually uh, one of the latest versions available. So it might be the case that you can install the latest version uh, but you want to, you might uh, run the risk of installing, let's say, a faulty package. Okay. So that's how we can get some information about a package. And one of the coolest things that SPAC does is it draws a dependency graph. So if I do SPAC graph OpenMPI, this is like really cool. Uh, I haven't seen any other tool do this very easily. So you will see the kind of a diagram here. And what this diagram is actually showing you is a dependency graph on of OpenMPI on all its dependencies. Okay, so you can see that HVLock uh, or OpenMPI depends on HVLock, HVLock depends on libxml2 and so on. So if you want to get a visual understanding of uh, how this dependency structure looks like in terms of a uh, in terms of a directed acyclic graph, uh, you can do that using this uh, SPAC graph command. So remember, I was talking a little bit about uh, SPAG being able to not only install software, but also offer you uh, some sophistication. So this is the kind of things that you can expect uh, in the sophistication category. SPAC didn't need to do this, but they do that uh, because it's a really useful thing to uh, visually see what are the dependencies of any package that you're trying to install. Okay. Um, so now let's go ahead and install a package. So I'm going to install the Tickle package. Now there's a good chance I already have Tickle with me. Uh, so if I do uh, locate Tickle, uh, I'm, I probably have Tickle on this computer, but I'm going to try to use SPAC to install Tickle. So I'm going to do SPAC install uh, Tickle, TCL. And if I do that, you will notice that SPAC is installing Zlib first. Why? Because Tickle depends on Zlib as a dependency. And we're going to see that right in a moment. Uh, but basically what this is doing is it's, it's going through the process of installing Tickle and all its dependencies. So it's handling the dependencies by itself. So you do not have to install Zlib uh, separately. You just write SPAC install TCL. That's a one line command that installs the package Tickle. Okay, And it figures out the dependencies on its own, a process called uh, concretization. So while this is going on, let me go ahead and create a new session to give you some more information. So I'm going to create a new session on the same computer. And 
I'm going to go to the same directory. And notice that now if I try to run the SPAC command in the new session, it will say that the command SPAC has not been found. And the reason it cannot find, find the command is because I haven't provided the right, I haven't added this directory to the environmental variables for this command window. Uh, so this is the command window where my install is going on. Uh, this is a new command window. So I need to use the source command again. So I'm going to do source, share, spac, setup, env. So every time you create a new command window or a terminal, you want to use the source command over here. And if you do not want to do this every single time, you can just add this command to your bash rc file or bash profile uh, file. So I'm going to do that. And now I will see I have my SPAC command available. And if I do SPAC uh, list, I can see again all the packages that are available. And if I look at the information on the tickle package, so I can do SPAC info tickle, I will see that the, there's a dependency on Zlib. There's a link dependency on Zlib. And that is why when I'm installing tickle, it's also installing Zlib first and then tickle. So if I were to look at, let's say, the graph of Tickle, that is just going to be Tickle, Zlib, only two nodes in this graph. And you can see that Zlib is a dependency for Tickle. And that's why Zlib was installed before Tickle. OK, so, um, so, for so far, does anybody have any questions? We have uh, gone through a fair bit. We have. Uh, listed all the packages available in SPAC. We have gotten information about packages and we have also installed a very simple package. Um, does anybody have any trouble with any of these commands or uh, does anybody have any questions? And if you're doing good, just give me a thumbs up or just say you're doing good. <clears throat> Okay. Yes, so if curl was missing from your machine and it was needed for tickle, uh, you, 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 if, if, curl, if, if curl was needed for tickle, uh, let's see, could you use spac to install curl? You can definitely use spac to install curl as long as it is listed in the package listing. So if I look at the package listing, is do we have curl here? Uh, if we have curl listed in this list of packages, then yes, you can use spac to install curl. Yeah, curl is listed here. So I can do spac info curl and I and it doesn't have it has a lot of dependencies, but I can use uh, spac to install curl. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so now we have just installed uh, Tickle. Uh, let us go ahead and try to see where it has been installed. So I'm going to run this spac location command. So I can do spac location. And I'm going to put this minus I flag because I just want to look at the full path. And I'm going to say Tickle. And so what you see here is where the package has been installed. And it's, it's kind of hard to read. And that's the feature, by the way. But it actually has been installed in the directory that I'm working in. So if I look at uh, this directory over here, that is inside my current working directory. And it has this complicated structure. But this is exactly where uh, my tickle has been installed. So if I look at, whoops, if I do ls on this uh, uh, file line, so I can actually do back location minus I take if, uh, if you know bash, you know what I'm doing. Uh, but this is basically showing me the contents of this directory that you see over here. And you can see it has the bin directory, the include directory, live directory, manual and share directory. So it has, so everything is installed, not in some fancy user bin or user local directory. It is, it is, it is downloaded and installed inside the directory that you're currently working in. Okay, so that's how that's where SPAC is installed. And now we can list all the packages that are available uh, in, in SPAC. So I can do SPAC find. So this is different from SPAC list. So SPAC find 
is just going to list the packages that have been installed. So now you will see that I have installed Tittle 8.6.10 uh, with Zlib uh, version 1.2.11. And these both have been installed using the uh, GCC compiler 7.5.0 because that is the compiler uh, that I have on my system right now. And uh, you might be asking, okay, so why, why were these versions selected? 1.2.11 and 8.6.10. To know that, you can look at uh, some info on TSA, on Tickle. So if I do SPAC info Tickle, you will see that the preferred version is 8.6.10, which is why 8.6.10 was installed. If I do SPAC info Zlib, I will see that the preferred version is 1.2.11, which is why uh, 1.2.11 has been installed. So anytime you do SPAC info for a certain package, it has a preferred version, which is what SPAC will install if you just run a command uh, SPAC install something or, or some package. Okay, so uh, SPAC find is uh, one command, but you can also give some more information. So I can also do SPAC find minus minus help to see what options I have. Uh, the options that I'll be interested in is the paths, uh, the long version, and I want to show the flags. So I'm going to do spac find minus ldf, and I want to I want to do this for all the packages. So now I will see something interesting here. So here, this is what what this is showing me is uh, is that tickle 8.6.10 has been installed with the a GCC compiler and it depends on Zlib and also Zlib has been installed. And you can see some hash strings over here. So these hash strings are unique identifiers for each package that has been installed. And the reason we have these hashes is because in order to avoid conflicts. So it, it, let's say if you wanted to install Tickle with a different version of Zlib, then you might have some kind of a conflict between the, the two very similarly named Tickle packages. So we have this hash to kind of avoid these conflicts. These are like unique identifiers, uh, unique number plates, so to speak, uh, to identify each specific installation of a package. All right, so uh, this completes five. Um, now let us look at uh, loading and unloading the package. So if I do spac load tickle, that is going to load the tickle package. So so notice that once, just because I've installed the package doesn't mean it's available for me to use. I need to load that package before I can use it. Um, so how do I uh, check that? So let's see. So if I, if I load this package and if I do spec find loaded, this is gonna list all the packages that are currently loaded. So as soon as I do spec load tickle, tickle that's going to give me the tickle package that I just installed and it's going to bring it to the system. So if you have used, let's see a module command, you might be familiar with what this is doing. So, uh, so if you do a module load command, it basically changes the environmental variables so that you can load a specific package. Uh, similar, similar to what this is doing, spac load tickle is making sure that the tickle package that has been already installed is now available to use. So now I can use this tickle package and this VLIP package. And similarly, I can also unload the package. I can do spac unload tickle. And now if I see spac find loaded, you will see that only the VLIP package is still loaded. I can also unload that. And I will see that now no packages are available, okay? That does not mean no installed packages are available because if I just do spec find, I will see that I still have the two packages installed, but none of them are loaded. So spec find loaded only lists the packages that are currently available uh, for you to use. Uh, and spec find lists all the packages that are installed. And, uh, and so if you wanted to uh, uninstall a certain package, now of course here, you can also install, let's say, the boost library. I'm not going to go over that in the context of time, but it's a very similar strategy. Any package you have, you want to make sure you install it first, and then you can use the spac load command to load the package into the memory. And similarly, you can unload it after you have finished using it. <clears throat> so now we have uh, all the packages here, and you can see 
these are all the locations. Um, and I think if I do P, that's going to give me the paths as well. So this tells me where what the packages are, where they have been installed, and you can see that it has been installed in my SPAC directory inside the OPT SPAC folder. Okay. Any questions so far? We have gone through plenty at this point. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Is anybody stuck at any particular situation? I'd be happy to go over that again. Okay. So let me go ahead and remove all the packages. So if I do SPAC uh, find that lists all the packages that are available to me, I'm just gonna go ahead and uninstall all of them. So I'm gonna do SPAC uninstall. I can specify the packages individually or I can put the minus A flag just to make sure everything gets uninstalled. So if you do SPAC install minus A, that's gonna remove all the packages that you've installed with SPAC. So I'm just gonna do that right now. And now if I do SPAC find, you will see that I don't have any packages that are available anymore. So that completes uh, everything that we have done till step eight. And now we're gonna look at step nine, which is to install packages with sophistication. Uh, so let's look at uh, the TCL, the tickle package again. So SPAC info tickle, uh, it has a whole bunch of packages, a whole bunch of versions. And let's say I want to install this 8.6.3 version because I have an application that is based on the 8.6.3 version and it doesn't work with the latest version of Tickle. So I need to install the older version of Tickle. So here what I can do is something as simple as spac tickle at 8.6.3. Okay, this is the command that you see over here. So if I do spac install tickle 8.6.3, that is going to install uh, the 8.6.3 version of, of Tickle, as you can see over here. Notice that it is still using the latest uh, Zlib uh, version because I didn't specify what Zlib, what version of Zlib to use. Um, and I'll show you how to specify that once this is done. And while this is going on, I can actually use my other terminal window to run the second command. So these are all completely independent parallel structures. So I, here in this case, I can do spac install tickle 8.6.3 with an older version of Zlib. So I'm using a, a caret sign over here, um, which means to say that you want to, I want to install tickle 8.6.3 with the 1.2.8 version of Zlib. So if I now do this, uh, this is going to install 1.2.8 as opposed to 1.2.11 that happened before. And so this gives you a way to install uh, Tickle, an older version of Tickle with a dependency on an older version of Zlib. So notice that some, doing something like this can be really complicated if you're not using SPAC because you have to go ahead and manually compile and build Zlib, the older version, and then you have to uh, uh, provide the right environmental path variables so that when you install Tickle, you're using the older version of Zlib and not the latest version of Zlib uh, and so on. So but SPAC makes all of this very easy with just a simple intuitive uh, single line command. Um, so while uh, these two Tickle versions are being installed, one with the latest Zlib and one with an older, uh, one with an older uh, Zlib, uh, let us go ahead and um, see what else we can do. Uh, we can also specify what compiler we want. So, so, so far, I haven't really specified what compiler to use, but we can actually specify uh, what compiler uh, we want. So both these installs have succeeded. So let us uh, look at uh, spac find, and you will see if I do LDF, you will see that I have two tickle versions 8.6.3, one which is installed with an older Zlib. And I have a, another Tickle version 8.6.3 that is installed with the latest Zlib. And then I obviously have the two Zlibs uh, listed as well. So you can see that these two Tickles can potentially conflict with each other because they have the same name. But if I wanted to load, let's say, 
tickle. So let's say if I want to do spec load tickle, there's going to be an immediate conflict, right? It doesn't know which one to which one to load because they both have the same name. So in this case, I can be more specific and provide the hash value. Whoops, sorry. Okay, so that thing has been loaded. So I'm going to do spack. Uh, I will do spack find. I will try to load tickle, but I cannot do that. So I'm going to specify the hash value of tickle, which is going to be uh, a 23. So I'm just going to put forward slash a two three e five p e. Now it's a lot but that is that that will make sure that the correct version of tickle is loaded so now if i do spec find loaded you will see that tickle 8.6.3 with zlib 1.2.11 has been loaded and similarly i can also unload that specific package using the hash and now if i do spec find loaded i still have something available because that's a dependency and let me unload everything so spec find, spec find loaded is nothing, and I have the four packages available. Okay, uh, somebody have a question here? I yeah, believe. hi, I have a yes. question. I guess it's yes. a little bit easier just like try to like, say it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just trying to think about like, from like a user perspective, does it mm -hmm. mean every time I you know log into the HPC, um, I have to install the particular package? That no. I need to use over again. No. no, no. Once you install it, it's already there on your home directory. So unless your home directory gets erased, uh, okay. stack will already be there. What you will have to do is you have to do every time you open a new terminal, you have to do that source command that I talked about. So you, you know, so you source to spec, but that yes. spec should have already have all the yes. packages that you chose exactly. to install Be for. Okay. Yes, because everything is everything is installed in this directory over here. So this okay. opt share directory spec that you see. That's going to have all the packages uh, uh, that we have installed so far, and that's not so going to disappear. You just need to load and unload it every you time. You just need to load it and unload it. And if okay. you uh, are you familiar with module? Yes. Okay, SPAC also module creates, load. creates module files. So this is something that your system admin will have to do. But uh, if there is time, I might mm -hmm. talk a little bit about it. But SPAC also creates its own module files, and if you provide that directory to the module pack. You can just do module load uh, TCL or something like that. Okay, cool. So, Thank so, you. But yes, spack load is also fine. Okay, so we have looked at how to install spack, how to install tickle with various dependencies. Uh, let's just go ahead and specify the compiler as well because why not? So if I do spack compilers, uh, you will see that uh, it has already found uh, these two compilers that are available on my system. So I have the CLang compiler available to me and the GCC compiler available to me. Um, so now if I wanted to install Tickle with, uh, let's say I want to install, I want to run this command here. Uh, I should not copy paste. So I will do spec install Tickle and I want to install the 8.6.3 version with a dependency on Zlib uh, 1.2.8. And I want to use the compiler. And now I have to use the percentage sign to indicate the compiler. And I want to use the uh, CLang compiler 6.0.0. And that's going to just do the same thing again. But this time, it's going to use the, the CLang uh, compiler uh, to compile the software. Uh, so, so it's pretty intuitive to use. So, for example, let's say uh, you can also use SPAC to install a compiler and then use that compiler to install further packages on SPAC. Um, so there's, there's a lot of various operations that you can do. For example, if you wanted to install, let's say, some Intel compiler or uh, some other LLVM compiler, uh, you could install that compiler using SPAC, make sure that is loaded, and then you would have to make sure that that compiler is added. So you want to make sure SPAC compiler add is something that you do. So let me show what that means. So if I do SPAC compiler remove CLang, 
and I do SPAC compilers, I just have the GCC compiler that's available to me because it hasn't because I've removed the CLang compiler. So if you have a situation like this where it doesn't know that you have a CLang compiler, you can just do SPAC compiler add and it will automatically figure out that there is a CLang compiler available in your path right now. Um, and so it will detect that compiler uh, automatically. So for example, if you were to, let's say, install a compiler using SPAC, you, will, you want to load this compiler using SPAC load. And then if you did SPAC compiler add, it would automatically uh, add that compiler in the list of available compilers. Yeah, so you can do all kinds of fancy things. Um, and finally, uh, we're almost running out of time. Uh, this is another command that you can see what SPAC is actually doing under the hood. So notice that we did something like SPAC install tickle right at the beginning, right? Because we didn't specify uh, what we wanted. We didn't specify any version. We didn't specify any dependencies. We didn't specify a compiler. Uh, if I just do SPAC spec install, it will show me what it's going to try to install. So this is the process of a concretization. So if I just do SPAC spec tickle, that is specifying what is happening under the hood. So it's, it's going to install the 8.6.10 version with new 7.5 with a dependency on Zlib 1.2.11 with GCC 7.5, and it's going to use uh, the GCC compiler. So the spec spec command is going to tell you what is happening under the hood. Uh, did anybody have any questions at this time? Okay, um, so that is how you can do some kind of sophistication. And uh, one thing that I would add is if, if you find this exciting, I would suggest looking at the, the SPAC uh, website. Um, let's see where that is. So if you go to SPAC, read the docs latest, uh, you will see that there is uh, a tutorial available. There are references available. The tutorial is pretty exhaustive. Um, so you can take a look at this tutorial to, to explore more with SPAC. Um, so that is where I would uh, suggest that you go from here. And um, finally, I, I won't talk a little, I won't talk much about module files right now, but I'm just going to show you that SPAC also creates module files. So if I go to this directory, uh, CD share SPAC modules, uh, this actually contains all the tickle module files that you can use to load modules into. So if you have a module command on your HPC machine, and if this uh, particular directory where the module files are located is in your module file, uh, is your, in your module path, uh, then you can simply do something like module load uh, tickle uh, instead of spac load tickle. Okay, so you can use the module command or the lmod to download these uh, to adjust the environmental variables uh, directly. Um, okay, so one question I have here, uh, SPAC with hardware specific installs. Uh, yes, so one of the things that uh, can be really complicated is if you're trying to install OpenMPI with GPU, right? So uh, how do you do that? If you're doing it by source, that can be uh, kind of complicated. If you're using SPAC, um, you will notice that if I get some information on the on the OpenMPI package, you will see that it does have an option to install with uh, CUDA. Okay, so you could just turn CUDA on, and um, so you would basically do SPAC install OpenMPI plus CUDA. Okay, this is what you would type. Okay, and if you do something like this, OpenMPI will be installed with CUDA on, and you can sort of see that if I do if I do if I look at the spec for this spec spec uh, tells me that it's going to install it with uh, 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 let's see yeah I'm not sure why this is not working. Uh, but you, you stack can also install hardware specific dependencies. Uh, if you have a GPU, you should be able to install a GPU specific spec. Yeah, uh, let, let me show you uh, just a little bit about what it looks like um, in, my, uh, in my actual computer 
in my HPC computer setup over here. And for that, I need to log on into a machine. So just give me a moment here. And I know I'm going a little bit beyond time. But I'm just going to sh uh, show you what it looks like to me as an HPC user. I'm going to log into my local cluster. Uh, and I hope I'm still audible. I'm just trying to log into my HPC machine. Uh, yeah, screen share is off because I need to put in some confidential information. Sorry. I'm just going to restart my screen share right now. Okay, so this is my um, HPC machine, uh, L0. Uh, let me make the screen size a little bit bigger. And so this is, you can see L01, that's actually my login node. So anytime you uh, log into an HPC machine, you're going to be in a login node, most cases. Um, so I have uh, um, my SPAC installed somewhere here. Uh, but if I run the SPAC command, you know, it's gonna say SPAC command not found. Uh, so basically what I have to do is I have to source, uh, uh, share, sorry about the bugs, shares back. I need to source that and now I can do SPAC and I can do SPAC find and you will see that I have zero installed packages. Um, and that's because I haven't really installed any packages using my user account. But uh, the thing is I have installed packages using SPAC on this machine using the root account so if I look at module available, you will see that these are the modules that are available to me. And I also have some SPAC modules that are available. So these module files that you see over here are basically that something that has been created using SPAC. So I can simply load uh, some SPAC modules uh, using just the module command. And just for an example, I'm just gonna use uh, the open MPI here. So I can do module load uh, open MPI. And now if I do MPI run minus minus version, that's gonna show that's the module that has been loaded. Because if I unload this, there is no MPI. Okay, so the module command also works very closely with the spec if for some reason you wanna use module. So that's going to be it for today's workshop. Uh, I know I went a little bit beyond time, but I also started five minutes late. So I think I am in good timing. So um, if you have any last minute questions, uh, feel free to add it into chat or uh, and Austin, if you need to pick me out, let me know. Yeah, I think we're ready to switch okay. over to our Python lesson, but okay. thank you. That was thank great. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll just okay. stop sharing. Hi, I'm I'm Ken. Can you hear me? Okay, looks like I can be heard. Should I give everyone just a couple of minutes maybe to uh, get a drink of water? Um, while while uh, well, that's happening. If you want to step away for a moment, I, I'll, I'll just give everyone a couple of minutes. Um, if you would in the chat, it'd be really uh, helpful if you could just type in some of the languages that you know. Uh, so I'll be talking specifically about some things having to do with Python, but maybe you've learned some JavaScript or C, maybe you know R uh, or Java, C++. Um, so it'd just be, it'd be interesting to know the other kinds of languages that you've worked with. 
good. I, I see R in JavaScript, a lot of R, was, which is definitely what I would expect. SQL is great. Thank you for putting that. MATLAB, fantastic. Cool. Um, Ken, sorry, could you make me yeah. host real quick uh, so I can help sure. you like, start the recording and stuff? Yeah, how do I do that? Uh, you just have to go to participants and uh -huh. on my name that says helper first. Got it. They... See it. Yes. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Perfect. I'm going to start the recording now. And if you need anything, I think I'm the only helper for this session. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your help. Of course. No, you're not. Okay. I'm here. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, perfect. Hi, Sebastian. Okay, so I guess I'll get started here. I'll, I'll be going slowly at first, um, so hopefully it won't, won't go too fast. I also want to be sharing my screen. So let me see how to do that. Um, I use so many different things. It's, it's hard to remember how to do this. Yeah, there we go, share screen, the big green button. Whoops, uh, it says you have disabled screen sharing. Maybe you have to make me host again. I should be able. Yeah, now you're a co-host, so you should be able to do everything. But if you leave, oh no, you know nothing will break down. Uh, let's see. It's actually okay. I'm having to do some silly things with system preferences. Um, I'm gonna have to leave apparently and come back uh, to enable screen. Let me just. All right, that was Adam. <laughs> Hold on tight. Okay, let me try to share my screen again. Great. Here we are. So um, what I'm going to be talking about today is, uh, uh, oh, hey, Julian, I see you. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking about how to uh, use some of the latest features in Python to help you write better code, and also a number of tools that exist out there that include linters and type checkers. Uh, and if you come from a language that has static types like C or Java, uh, some of this is going to be familiar to you. If you have only used languages that are dynamically typed, uh, like Perl, Python, JavaScript, uh, and R, um, some of this is going to be rather new. Uh, but hopefully you'll, you'll quickly see the advantage of, of using these, these kinds of ideas. Um, I wanted to go over a little bit on the, uh, on the page for, the, for this, uh, just to cover a few things. Uh, there was, I, I did put a lot, a lot of stuff up about uh, how to set up your environment. And unfortunately, I won't be able to step through all that, but it's, it's pretty well laid out in this new book that I've written. It's called Mastering Python for Bioinformatics. Um, and I'm going to be using that text. And you have uh, complete access to this for free through the U of A library. So if you can go to this link here, and if you search for that title, uh, it will come up with an electronic version uh, that's available through uh, O'Reilly's Safari platform. Um, so uh, I encourage you to open that up and I'll just be starting in the preface this morning and hopefully getting through part of chapter one. That's, that's my goal for today. And uh, the, the, the ultimate goal is to write a program that will uh, solve uh, the first problem from this website called Rosalind.info. Uh, Rosalind Franklin, of course, uh, should have received a Nobel Prize for her work on uh, DNA crystallography, uh, but she didn't. She died young. Um, and uh, let me just log in here with, so the Rosalind, but she did get this website named after her. So it's all the same, right? Um, uh, and on the Rosalind website, okay, all this, uh, there, it's a number of bioinformatics challenges. They're very popular uh, for, for learning uh, bioinformatics. 
and 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 it and it introduces a lot of the kinds of ideas that we use a lot in uh, in, in bioinformatics. And so, uh, mostly what I'm going to be showing is how to write a command line program. So you could solve this, you know, in any language whatsoever. There's nothing about Roslyn that asks you to use Python or any particular language. Um, and and you could put in the data however you like. But I'm specifically going to show you how to write with Python a command line program that documents and validates its arguments and then uh, has tests to verify that it actually works correctly so that you can then uh, learn how to do things called refactoring. So, you know, the challenge is given this any string of DNA, count how many A's, C's, G's, and T's that you find. So ultimately, that's what we're going to be trying to do. Um, uh, and all of this is covered in, uh, that's the entire first chapter is how to write this. Um, if you're on a Windows platform, I uh, you're, you're pretty much going to have to install Windows subsystem for Linux, uh, which uh, seems like a very uh, high bar. You basically have to learn a new operating system uh, in order to write uh, command line programs. But it, it's just a fact. Uh, I have a Windows laptop. It is utterly worthless for this kind of programming. Uh, so I have installed uh, WSL. Um, I use version one because of the security uh, re requirements of mine, but WSL2 is, is it's a preferred version. So uh, however you have to do that, it, it works. Um, and uh, Apple uh, users, you can just open a terminal. Uh, the, the, the native terminal application is just fine. Uh, I, I use iTerm2, but it doesn't really matter. And, and of course, if you're on Linux, probably all of this is old hat to you. Um, I will be showing you how to use a code editor called VS Code. Um, it's it's quite good. A lot of people like uh, these kinds of integrated development environments. They're called IDEs. Uh, I tend to just write in a terminal using uh, the Vim editor and running things on, on the command line. But if you're more comfortable in an IDE, uh, you should absolutely use it. Um, they, they can incorporate a lot of, uh, of helpful uh, hints and, 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 and menu options so that things aren't quite so scary when you're writing a program. Um, all the source code is in this GitHub directory. Um, if I go to that, uh, if you're, if we you're have familiar, a, sorry to interrupt. We yes, have go a ahead. question in the chat. Why wouldn't oh. Git Bash work for something like this? It might uh, on Windows, but it, it, there's it's it's Git Bash is just like only implements a little bit of the command line. I'm uh, so you could use it, for instance, to check out the GitHub uh, repository, uh, but I don't think that it's going to like really respect your environment and, and help you install Python and all the things that you, you would need to do. Actually, is it possible for me to see the, the, the chat in addition to... Should be, yes. You uh, should be able to, in the screen sharing bar you have somewhere, click chat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are screen sharing. There should be a chat somewhere or, oh no, it's in the three dots on the far right, I believe. Okay. It's all from memory. Uh, yeah, thanks, John. Same. I see the three dots and I see record, show subtitle, reactions. I don't see something. It doesn't well, say chat. I, I just don't see it, hmm. but I'm old, so. Maybe um, so, right next to the share screen button. I think I think it's different when you're actually sharing the screen. Yeah. And well, uh, I guess uh, if you would just alert me to those kinds of uh, chat questions, I, I would really appreciate it. I'm just looking at these other options. Oh well. Uh, so if you're familiar with uh, with with GitHub. Um, you can uh, click on this code button here, and then you can highlight the, uh, the probably this this URL to to clone this. Uh, and all of this is is covered also in in the preface. But uh, I show here, like for instance, uh, in your home directory, I might suggest you create something called work or Python or something like that, and then you could clone this in into that directory. And now you should have a directory like this, and and that's going to be useful because. I have provided a lot of tests and data for you to work with uh, for all of this. Um, it's possible that you already have Python installed. If it's version 386, uh, that's okay. That's a pretty good version. The latest version out right now is like, uh, uh, actually, is it 395? I did something like that. Um, it is good to know how to downstall, download and install uh, Python from source. 
Uh, so I would recommend ultimately that you do that. But if you already have a version of Python, it should be fine. There are a number of uh, requirements for uh, all the code. And inside the root directory of, of, of this is a uh, file called requirements.txt. It's, it's a very common way to uh, indicate uh, modules that need to be installed. And so I didn't indicate any uh, versions of this. I just, whatever's the latest version is probably just fine. So all of these modules need to be installed in order to do ultimately all the exercises. Um, for instance, uh, I definitely uh, am going to be showing you about PyLint, which is a linter which finds problems with your code. Uh, another one called Flake 8, uh, which is in here. It's, a, it's, it's just another kind of linter. Uh, and I'm also going to be showing you a tool called MyPy, which checks for uh, how you use types. And, and then there are ways to, uh, to test your program using PyTest. And then there are some integrations for those tools to be used within PyTest. So, um, and, and don't worry, I'll, I'll show you what all this means here as, as we're working through it. So, uh, oh, maybe I should have introduced myself at the beginning. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Ken Ewens Clark. Uh, I have been a senior scientific programmer at the University of Arizona. Last fall, I, I joined the Critical Path Institute as a data engineer, but I still do some part-time work for the U of A. Um, also, I will hopefully be teaching a class this fall, uh, Biosystems Analytics, which is a uh, course BE 434. Um, I've taught that before, uh, but this this one this time I'll actually be the teacher of record. Uh, so um, if you have if you are interested in this and would like to spend a whole semester learning how to write uh, better and cleaner Python, uh, you're welcome to join me. Um, so that's kind of the intro here. All right, uh, let me get back to. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to I'm going to start off by showing you a simple program. Let me make that much bigger um, to kind of get at some of what I'm talking about. This is a, a program that I just wrote. Uh, it's a very simple command line program. It it asks for your name and then it's going to print hello to your name. So let me show you how that works. If I run this type check, it's going to say, what is your name? And I'm going to say Ken, and it's going to say, hello, Ken. Um, so a, a few things to, to note here. It, when, I, when I write a command line program, it's typical for me to use something called the shebang line here. So um, in bash, this is uh, uh, essentially, it kind of starts off like a, a, a shell script. And in bash, the percent sign or the hash sign um, uh, the hash sign is a comment. And this is a special comment. It's followed by uh, the exclamation point, which is often called bang because it's a lot shorter to say. So we colloquially call that shebang. Uh, so the shebang line tells uh, sh the shell to run the environment and find Python 3. Uh, so there could be a number of Pythons installed on your, on your system. And I'm telling it to just find the one that the environment finds and use that to execute the rest of this program. So that's what's going on on this line. And then I'm using the input function to get your name. This is the prompt that is that is put to the screen. And then the result is put into the name. And that's going to be a string. Everything that comes from the input line is a string. And then I can uh, print this uh, using an F string, which I'll talk about in a minute. And I can interpolate this variable inside here by putting it in, in, uh, in uh, uh, squiggly brackets. So uh, it, it runs, and, and hopefully everyone understands that. If I do something completely silly, like try to divide the string by two, that's just an illegal operation. Um, and, and so the question I would have for you, and, and maybe you could monitor the chat, I, I would ask you, if you're, especially if you're not familiar with Python, what would, you, what would your expectation be of this program? Should it, should it even compile? Should it even run? Or will it run and then ask me my name and then blow up? Um, so, so who thinks it will it will run? Uh, it won't even compile. Who thinks it, that, that this is just wrong and it won't it won't even compile? I see one hand. Um, okay, um, you're wrong. It 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 unfortunately will run. It will ask for your name, and then at the moment when it says you know hello, when it tries to print that, it's going to blow up because it's going to try to divide the name by two. So let me run this, and I'll put in my name. And you see it ran. It asked me for my name, and then it blew up at runtime. So we call that a runtime exception because uh, it created an exception. Uh, the exception right here is, is a type error. 
Uh, if you're not familiar with exceptions, you, you wouldn't know that that's an exception, but in Python, that's what's happening. And it's, it's telling me exactly what the problem is. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to mix strings and integers in a, in a, in a numeric operation that's, that's just not going to work. Um, unfortunately, it would seem like that that's, that's information that, that Python would have when it even, before it even starts to try to run. Like the first thing it has to do is, is read the whole program top to bottom and, and make sure that it's actually valid syntax. Well, this is valid syntax, it's just not valid code. And, and so you would, you would kind of hope that uh, maybe it would stop you, it would prevent you from doing this because this is an extremely simple uh, program. It has two lines of code and there's, and there's one bug. Uh, what happens when there's 500 lines of code or 5,000? There's lots of potential bugs waiting in there. And so if you're coming from a statically typed background like C or Java, you would know intuitively, well, you know, if I say something's a string, then I can't use it in a numeric operation like that. Uh, and so we have these tools called linters that will help find things, uh, find problems with our code. And, and I said, I, like one of them is called PyLint. And I can run PyLint on this program. And the most, thing, the most that it has to complain about is that I haven't put a doc string here. And so a doc string, if I was going to make this happy, would, it would just be basically a bit of documentation, like uh, do something stupid. Um, and, 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 and that is that is enough for it to be a doc string. It's basically just a string that documents what this program does. And, and once I've done that, now PyLint is happy. It's like, yeah, I can't see anything else wrong with your code. 10 of 10, you're doing great. So uh, there's another one that we have called Flake 8, and I'll run that on here. And the fact that it has nothing to say at all means that, again, it finds no problems with this. But there's another tool out there that's been uh, in introduced in the last few years is called MyPy. And if I run that on this program, it actually finds the type error. So it, it says here on line six, you're doing something that you shouldn't do. Now, this is happening without my running the program. This is called a static checker. So it's actually just looking at the source code and finding that there's a problem. And if I go here to line six, sure enough, there's the problem. And so if I get rid of that and go back and run my pie, bam, no issues. So uh, this is something that's new to Python, the, the, the addition of, of type hints uh, and I can actually put in here a type hint, and it looks like it does in, in other languages. It's a colon followed by the type. So as the str type in, in Python is a string. So if I say name is a string, then I'm, I'm actually annotating it in the source code. And sometimes you, a lot of times you need to do that for MyPy because it can't figure out what the type of, of, of a variable is going to be. So as your pro Python programs get longer and longer, it becomes more and more necessary to, to run these kinds of linters and type checkers and to also incorporate types into your, uh, into your program so that you can get this kind of checking. OK, so with that, um, that that's kind of an overview of, of, of a bit, you know, the TLDR here of, of what I'm going to be going over. Are, are there any questions so far? I'm going to drink a bit of water. Okay, I'm going to see, I'm going to, I guess, I, do I have to stop sharing in order to, to look at the, uh, trend, the chat? I'm just going to look at the chat. Okay, so no problems here so far? Okay, go back to squaring. Okay, so I'm going to close this. Uh, I'm going to reference the, the book now. Um, and, and I'm going to go back here to a few things. Hopefully, you're able to just read along um, uh, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, with the, the, you could pull it up in your web browser, and it's, it's all the same content, uh, all the same text. Um, and so I'm just going to go over a few things. Um, here I note that, that since Python 3.6, you can add these type hints. So if you have anything older than 3.8, really, you should, you should upgrade. Um, and, and I talk about using, uh, PyTest, PyLint, Flake 8, and another one I'm going to introduce here is argparse, which is basically how we can document the, the parameters to our program. Um, and so um, I talk a bit here about uh, object-oriented programming and why I'm categorically opposed to it uh, and, and why I even avoid exceptions. Uh, I, I tend to, to try to stress a purely functional approach 
And if that doesn't make any sense to you, I think it would after you read a lot more of my code. Um, I, I've introduced here the Rosalind website and, and exactly what, what its background is here. Um, and and I'm, there are dozens and dozens, maybe even hundreds of problems to solve there. And I only take the first 14, um, or not even the first, but I take 14 of the, of the earlier programs just to kind of, because uh, they, they demonstrate a lot of things that, that we encounter a lot in, in, Python, in, in bioinformatics programming. Um, I've only been actually programming in Python for a few years. I spent most of my time learning bioinformatics uh, using Perl. Uh, and doing a lot of web development. Uh, I started with Perl around 1998 uh, and really used it for about 15 or so years. Uh, and so in the Perl community, uh, there's this, this, this mantra is there's more than one way to do it. And, and that's actually very frustrating for a lot of people about Perl. Uh, Python sort of has the exact opposite approach, which is that there should be just one way to do things and it should be obvious. Um, and, and that doesn't always work out. There actually are many ways to do things in Python, and I'd like to show you, uh, hopefully, uh, how, how many different ways we can count the nucleotides in, in a string of DNA. So I kind of take a different approach to, to, to coding Python. Um, one of the things that I really try to, to, to drive home is this idea of test-driven development. So you should actually write tests. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily matter if you write them first or you write them after. Um, the, the point of this book and this material is that they have already been written. They've been written for you. They do exist first. And, and that is technically the way that you're supposed to use test-driven development. But you know, in practice, as you're developing something organically, you don't necessarily know how it's going to work. So maybe you get to a point, your program does something, you're like, okay, I need to make sure it always does this thing, so I'll write a test for it. And I'm going to show you just how simple those tests can be. But the idea of test-driven development is, is this. You create a test, you run your code, and you verify that your, your program actually fails. Like, it does not do this thing that the test says it should do. Then you write the code that passes the test, then you run the test and you verify now it does do the thing it's supposed to do. And then now that the program works and does something like, okay, now it actually counts the nucleotides, now you have the ability to refactor your code. So refactoring is basically finding a better way to do the thing. So maybe your, your program works, but it's dog slow. So now you need to speed it up. Um, but once it passes the test and you know that it's possible to pass the test, then you have some baseline to always go back to. It, it doesn't matter if it works faster, if it gets the wrong answer. It, all, it still has to be correct, but you have the freedom to, to, uh, to play with it now. And, and basically, test-driven development is just this over and over and over again. Every time you want to write a new feature for your program, you add a test, you add the feature, cycle, the cycle repeats. Um, I have some in, uh, information here about uh, using the command line and installing uh, installing Python. Uh, it's very important. And then a little bit there more about uh, checking out the, the code with GitHub and, and how you can even fork the repository if you'd like to basically make a copy of the repository and work in it yourself um, and, and a few other things there. Here's the bit about installing the modules that you'll need. Um, there's a couple different ways that you can install them. Uh, I often use this incantation, uh, but sometimes you, you might use um, PIP3. Uh, it just depends, especially if you're on like a Windows platform, that might be better. Um, and some things here about these initialization files for PyLint and, and, and MyPy um, uh, that could be important for later programs that we write. Um, so one of the things that, that I, I, I have done for years now with my students is, is I think it's important to not start from a blank page. Um, so if, if, if you're trying to, uh, and, and actually I saw um, Hadley Wickham talk when he came a couple of years ago uh, to talk about R and R Studio. And, and he, he pointed out you know, the difference between using a statistics program like Jump, with, which is very menu driven. So you, know, you wanna do something, you can probably find the menu option to help you stub out that code or write that analysis. And, and how different that is from R, which just presents you with you know, the prompt to, to start writing code. And, and, that's, and that's very intimidating. I mean, you basically have to know what you're gonna write before you write it. Uh, and, and I think that's a very difficult way to get started. So I wrote this program called New PY that helps you create a new Python program. And you can install it using pip uh, from the command line. And once you install it, you get this program called New PY. And, and if I uh, go here on, uh, on my on my computer, I'll just go into my home directory for a moment, and I'll say new py, and I'll call it uh, RB2021. 
and bam, it just created a program for me. Um, so, so it's basically two steps. You, you have to run this to, to install new PY. And once that runs, actually, or I can just post paste it in here. It probably won't do anything yet because it's already been installed. And so once you do that, uh, now you can run new PY. And if you run new PY without any arguments, it will actually tell you how it's supposed to be used. And if you'll notice the very first word here is usage. So it's typical to call this the usage statement. And, in, and what I wanna show you is how you can create a program that also creates a usage statement that says, oh, you didn't give me the right uh, arguments. You need to give me this in order for me to run. Um, and I can also run new PY with uh, dash dash help. And it will present a longer version of, of this um, or dash H. Um, so this is very, very common in command line based programs. Uh, it's, it's pretty much universally expected that your program will respond to dash H and dash dash help flags with, you know, something uh, like a usage. And, and, and so that's what we have here. So with this, we're going to use this program to create this new pro, uh, another program that is going to be called DNA.py that's going to uh, count the uh, count the nucleotides. And actually, I, I, I lied here. I meant to be showing you all this from uh, from within VS Code because probably this is uh, more friendly to you. And I want to make sure that I'm not. Uh, acting like an old man here who's only been using the command line for 25 years. So um, here I am inside VS Code, which is, uh, I, I, I shudder to say, is a Microsoft product. Uh, I come from uh, in the mid to late 90s when, when Microsoft just had nothing but enmity for, for Linux and I was getting into open source programming. Uh, I really came to just detest Microsoft. But I, I have to tip my hat to them. VS Code is actually a really uh, a usable piece of software unlike Outlook. Um, and and this, is, this is actually a pretty pleasant way to write code. And so here I am inside the, the source code uh, that, that I, I checked out from GitHub, and I'm in the 01 DNA directory. And, uh, and if I do an LS, which is a file listing, um, there, there is actually a DNA uh, in there right now from, from my having solved it earlier. I'm going to get rid of it. And if I LS, I'll see there's a bunch of solutions there already. And if you want, you can run, you know, solution one. And so I'm running it by saying dot slash, which is, uh, oh, because I'm tight. Um, I'm running it by doing dot slash, which dot is uh, uh, the current directory and then slash is the directory separator. So I'm saying run the solution one iter dot py that's in this directory. Uh, and 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 because of the uh, shebang line that I mentioned earlier, it's finding that this is a Python 3 program and then running the rest of the program with Python 3. And if I run this, I see that just like new PY, without giving this any arguments, it's saying, hey, you need to give me uh, an argument. It's required and it's called DNA. I'm like, okay, well, let's, let me just give it AAAA. Uh, and, and if I do that, it's going to print 5000. Zero, zero, zero. So the five is how many A's it found, and then the, Z, the C's are, are in the second spot, G's are in the third, and, and T's are in the fourth. So it found five A's and, and nothing of anything else. Uh, and so we're going to look at how to do that. But the first thing is, how do we write a program that, that just does this part, that just validates uh, the, the command line arguments? Because this is honestly one of the most crucial things that you need to get right when you're writing command line programs. Um, it's very common in bioinformatics to build enormous pipelines. The previous speaker was talking about working on HPCs. Uh, that's a very important part of when you get into large data analyses. Uh, you might have hundreds of sequence files that you need to analyze, and uh, and, and maybe one of you, you know some of them, a good percentage of them, might be corrupted. They didn't make the 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 the, the trip from the sequencing uh, facility to your HPC or just you know a, a disk got corrupted and 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 somewhere along the way you know some portion of your of your data is bad and if you're not validating the input files and then you know uh, uh, loudly failing when 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 you can't do something then you might just run the whole analysis and get spurious results because you didn't use all of your data and at no point did you know the the programs in the middle ever say stop you know i got something unusable here you need to fix this before i can go forward so i'm going to show you how to do that so i'm going to say new py 
dna.py. That's the name of the program that I want to create. And when I do that, it says done. And I just created a new new PY, uh, I mean, a, a new program called dna.py and it, and it shows up here. And if I open it with my text editor, uh, you see it has a lot of code already written uh, about, oops, about 85 lines of code that was written for you. And so, you know, let's let's run it now and see what happens. It gives me this usage and it says, okay, uh, right now this program accepts something dash A, uh, dash I something, dash F something, uh, dash O, and then also stra. Um, and so uh, just a little bit of, of information here about th this usage that we're looking at, the arguments that are in square brackets, that is a meta, uh, uh, like a meta characters telling you that these are optional arguments. So they're options. Uh, some of them Sorry, take can, a value. Can I just yes. interrupt you quickly? Um, the yes. chat asks if you can go to full screen that people can see better. Okay. Thank you. Is that better? I can also just try to make the text larger. Yep, better, thanks. Thank you. So uh, the, the arguments that are in square brackets are optional. Some of them take values. Some of them don't. The dash O flag is just stands by itself. So that's called a flag. But this one says it takes a file. Um, and then at the end, it says, just says stra, which means it takes some sort of a string. Uh, so let's look at the code that, that creates that. Um, uh, I'm going to go to the bottom here uh, because oddly, this is, this is kind of how Python works. Python reads the entire file top to bottom. And if you just start writing Python code, like the, the, the one that I showed you to start off with, it didn't have any of all this, this extra stuff. It just had a couple lines of Python just right there in the main body. And so when Python read those, it just executed them. Uh, here, I've created more structure. I've created a couple functions. Um, and, and, the, and the program is going to start in this function called main. And if you come from C and Java, that probably uh, feels feels like home to you. Uh, if you if you've only ever like written in like uh, uh, R, you you may understand. Be curious why main in, in programs like that have a, a heritage from C. Uh, there needs to be a main module, and in that main module, there needs to be a main function. That is just where the program starts, always and forever. Amen. So uh, I, I like to mimic that with with Python. I I just feel more comfortable starting in main. Um, but if I don't tell Python to actually go execute main, it will never do that. So uh, this program is read top to bottom by Python. And when it gets to these last two lines, um, when the program is being executed, the name double underscore name double underscore, that is a special variable inside Python that will be set to this string double underscore main double underscore. Uh, they're also they're often called dunders uh, for double underscore. Uh, it's it's something that I kind of detest about Python, but this is simply the way it works. So that's what this last two lines do. They do, they look to see if this 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 module is being executed as a program from the command line. So that's what's going on. So what's going to happen is that the program starts in main, and I've added type annotations. So if you've never seen this in Python before, this is what it looks like to say uh, to 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 define the arguments and the return type of a, of a of a function. So this uh, main never takes arguments. So uh, if there were arguments, they would go here inside the uh, parentheses. And this uh, main doesn't return any value. So I, I'm using the special value none to say that it, it nothing will come back from this. And the first thing I always do is call get args. Um, and this seems like, uh, I, I hope it doesn't seem like uh, uh, just uh, beating you over the head with this, but this is how to create a well-structured Python program that validates its command line arguments. So uh, this, this may seem a bit tedious, I hope not too much, but this is really necessary and, and hopefully I'm gonna show you why. So, so get args is gonna be called, and then it's going to have all these arguments that have been defined inside get args. So let's look at get args. Um, this is using a module called argparse, and there's a lot of documentation that you can find on argparse. Uh, in order to use it, I need to import it at the top of the program. It, the imports don't have to be at the top, but it's just, it's good style. Um, and you remember when I was running pylint on that first program and it said there's no doc string? Uh, you'll notice here up at the top is a doc string. Um, there's a, 
Okay, there we go. So at the top of this is the, the same shebang line that I talked about in that, in that one simple, you know, what is your name program. Uh, it's trying to execute Python 3. It put here, uh, a doc string is simply a string. You notice it's not being assigned to anything. It's just a string that exists literally inside the program. And I'm using Python's triple quotes to allow me to use new lines inside of it. Um, and so I can put whatever data I want here. It's just strings and it's actually completely ignored by Python. Um, so uh, it's, I think it's good, uh, good form to put your name and the date, your email address in case someone has a problem. Like if you're writing this program for someone else in your lab, it's important for others to know who wrote this. Um, and, 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 and actually it can be really useful to know when you wrote something because you'd be like, wow, a lot of time has passed. So that's a doc string up at the top. Uh, it's very typical to put all of your import statements together at the top of the program. It's not a requirement. It just is nice. Um, and I'm going to talk about this typing stuff in just a moment. Um, but that's, that's a, a new module that has existed for the last few years that allows me to describe the type of data. Uh, so I'm going to be using arg parse to create this argument parser. And this is a lot of text to try to remember. That's why I don't want you to ever try to remember it. I think you should use new PY to just uh, stick this in there, boilerplate for you. And then all you need to do is go in and, and alter these things. In the, in the parlance of, of, of command line programs, uh, there are different types of arguments. This one here is a positional argument because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, meaning is derived from its position on the command line. There's a, there's a, a, a very useful program uh, or command called chmod. And if I don't run it with any, with any arguments, it tells me that in its own way, uh, which is not extremely helpful, that it requires two arguments. One is the mode, like something like 755. And then the other thing is the entry of the file. And if I get those things mixed up, it's not going to work. So if I were to try, you know, try to chmod uh, my DNA program to 755 or 755, that's not going to work because I got the positional arguments in the wrong order. The, 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 the mode has to come first and then the name of the program to, you know, the name of the file or the directory to apply that to. So that's a positional argument. Um, but Chamad also has all of these options. Like, for instance, if I wanted to change all of the uh, programs uh, recursively going down through, all, through this directory, uh, I could use dash R. So that's a flag. It's a flag is, is something that's either present or not. So when dash R is present, it says do this thing recursively. When it's not present, it's just don't do that. Um, and so that is uh, this is the the boolean flag that I that I define here. That's a flag. So this is how you would uh, if you wanted something like that in your program that's either on or off. This is how you define that. It's also possible to have uh, arguments that are named, but they're options. So it could be there, and if it's there, it should be this value. Um, so if you wanted to do something like that, that was a string value, like, uh, like you were creating a program to, to that, that greeting program, like let's say instead of it asking you using the input, it was going to expect that your name was a command line argument. And maybe also the greeting could be an optional argument. So instead of saying, hello, Ken, it could say, you know, greetings, Ken. Uh, and so the greetings could be an optional argument but it takes a value. And so that's how you define, here's how you would define one that takes a string value. Um, if you wanted actually that value to be uh, an integer, you could actually put the type here as int. Uh, and let me show you what happens here. So all of these have been, uh, have been defined in our program. Let me, so let me show you, if I try to give an integer value that is, you know, foo, and I, and I have to give it some other positional argument for this to work, um, notice what it does for me. It says that's an invalid integer value, foo. Uh, so it rejected it. And I didn't write that code, argparse did. So I'm getting all this kind of checking for free. Um, I can run this program without that argument because it, it's optional. And you notice here when, it, when I run it without any, uh, I have to get this positional argument that, that's required. But notice that the integer argument has a default value of zero because I, I indicated that here, the default value is zero. And likewise, if I wanted to change the default value for this dash A flag, I could, you know, make this be, uh, you know, cookie. Um, and if I run this again, 
you'll see that the string argument has a default value of cookie now. So this is a really convenient way of creating a command line interface for your program um, that, that can set reasonable defaults uh, and, and also validate the data that's coming in so that people aren't allowed to give you, you know, a bad integer value. Um, uh, are there any are there any questions about this for a moment? So, one of the the reason why this is important is because the goal is to create a program that you can change the behavior of the program without changing the code. So, if you're used to writing, say, an R program or maybe a Jupyter notebook, and you have an input file that you want to 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 work on you're probably used to changing some line in your code that says, you know, input file is this, this directory name. And then when you get a new set of data, you change it to a new directory name or a new file name, and then you run it on that. The point of this is that we, we should not change our code in order to change that kind of uh, behavior. That's a parameter to the program. We should just be able to give it from the command line go process this file or go process these 500 files and, and it should be able to take care of that for us. And, um, and, and likewise, so if we're, gonna, if we're going to accept these things as command line parameters, we also need to be able to validate that they're, that they're, that they're good. Um, so I, I've showed you here, you know, dash I foo, it also will reject anything like 3.4 because that's not an integer. Um, so, you know, let's say that you were trying to uh, you had you wanted a flag that was like a p value uh, and you wanted that to be a float like I can change this to be you know float, which is a type in in uh, in Python and I'll call this float and maybe I'll change this to dash p uh, and I'll change this to p value. I'm going to save that and if I run the program and ask for the help, you see now that my flag has been changed to a floating point and it has the name has been changed it defaults to zero and now if i run this uh, actually i have to change this code down here the the i'm going to change this to a uh, p value so if i want to, to print the p value it's going to be available to me in the args.p value and i'll change this here p value So let me let me run this now with a p value of say 0.4, and it still requires you know some sort of a command line. Uh oh, has no int. Uh, what did I do wrong? Um, oh well, let's see. It's saying line 61. So let me find that. Oh right, p value. Ah okay. So. Uh, now, now I have to talk about uh, the, 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 this args structure. So um, what you saw there was that uh, I was trying to update my code and I missed a spot. Uh, I was trying to reference a field that didn't exist. And the reason is because I created a type to represent the arguments to my program. And, and so now let's go back and talk about this bit here. I created this class called args. And, and, and I said at the beginning that I, I, I pretty much detest object-oriented programming, um, but here I am creating a class. Um, and I'm using this class as um, essentially like a struct from C, if you're familiar with that. I'm sure Java has something similar. And the, in, the only thing that I would say that you need to know about objects is that they can inherit from each other. So it's very much like a taxonomy, like we have mammals, uh, and, and then mammals, uh, uh, the subclass of that is primates. So primates have all the things that mammals have, right? Uh, I hope I said that right. Anyway, so, um, and, and so here we're saying that args inherits from this thing called named tuples. So now I have to talk about what named tuples are. And, and for that, I'd like to go back to this uh, a little bit. Um, I'm going to start here. Here we are in, in, the, in the first chapter, and I'm going into a little bit of the things that I've showed you, like how this program works right now. And, and, and I haven't showed you PyTest yet, but I start here talking about starting the program with new PY and, and getting into this. Um, and, and we saw that about PyLint. And, and uh, so here we are with named tuples. So uh, what I want to talk about for a moment is what, what is a tuple in Python? Well, Python has these things called lists, and tuples are essentially immutable lists. So let's let's just talk about lists for a second. So a list is an ordered sequence of, of items. So let me make this a little bit bigger. Maybe I should make that full screen. 
Well, okay, that's fine. So a, a list, uh, I can create a list in Python, and, and I'm showing here the, 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 the Python REPL. Um, so REPL stands for R-E-P-L, which uh, stands for read, evaluate, print, loop. Uh, and, that, and that's the bit here that, that I'm talking about using the interactive interpreter. So uh, in, in VS Code, let me, let me show you how I can do this. Whoops, not, not that. There it is. Um, I can, uh, let's see, I think debug console is what it, mm. let me see. I tell you what, I'm just going to use uh, iTerm because I'm more familiar with it. So here in iTerm, if you type Python 3 all by itself, you should get something like this, uh, just an interactive interpreter that is a little similar to in R Studio. You can just you know start up R and you can just type in commands in R and, and create data structures and then look at them and evaluate them. Uh, so this is very much the same kind of a thing. It's just a console for entering Python code. And so, you know, if you if you say, you know, if you just put in text, obviously that's not valid Python. So at the moment that you hit enter, Python tries to parse it into Python. And, and if, it, if it can't, then it just throws its hands up and here's a, a syntax error. So um, with that, like I'm creating something called seeks. Um, and in Python, um, all you, as with many other languages, a variable is created when you assign it a value. So I'm going to create the variable called seeks. Like, like for instance, if I just say, what is seeks? Uh, it's not defined I, I, because I haven't created the variable yet. So if I say seeks is equal to, uh, and seeks is going to be short for sequences, is going to be equal to an empty list. So in Python, we can use double brackets to indicate an empty list. And now, uh, now seeks is something. So if I evaluate seeks by just typing the name and hitting enter, it shows me that it's an empty list. Another way to set that is, is to use the list function um, like that. And they're, they're, they're both going to be the empty list. And there's a, there's a function in Python called type. Uh, and it will tell me what is the type of a, of, of a variable. And so I can see here, this is a list and it doesn't matter how I create it with the square brackets with the list function, it, it is a list. Um, and so uh, that's, that's a little bit about the REPL. Uh, that's important to show because of, of what I'm trying to show you here is that I'm creating this thing called seeks uh, and then I'm, uh, uh, I can change it. I can append a sequence to it by, uh, and, so, and that will add one sequence to the end. And now a sequence has one value and, and it's ACT. Um, there's also a function in there called extend. Uh, and it, it takes a list and basically puts the contents of that list on the end of this. And so now seeks has three values. Um, something to know is that in Python, you can alter the elements in a list. And in Python, unfortunately, is zero-based uh, indexing. So the first element in seeks is at position index uh, zero. So I can actually mute, I can mutate that directly inside the list by just setting it to a new value. Um, whether that's good uh, or bad, Yes, go ahead. Sorry, could you make the font a bit larger? Somebody asked in the chat. Yeah. There you go. It's uh, let me. So hopefully that's a little better. So I can I can change the uh, any of the sequences in place. Um, and 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 if you think that's good or bad, the you know depends probably on on your background. But it is it is possible to do that. And so. Um, that's just a little bit about lists. So tuples are very much like lists in that they are an ordered uh, sequence of uh, possibly heterogeneous item, uh, items. So in Python, a, a list is never required to be all integers or all uh, strings. That you can just be whatever you want to put in there. Um, and, and, and again, that, that could be good or bad. I, I think it's generally bad, uh, but that's just how Python works. A, a tuple is exactly the same, except that you can't change it. Once it's been created, no part of it can be changed. So the, it, it's a little odd that, that um, 
the way to create a tuple is just to simply put commas in between things. Uh, so I can create a tuple here and I can look at its type and verify that this is a tuple. Uh, but syntactically, most people are used to seeing tuples represented with, with a round brackets or parentheses around them. So that's also a tuple, but it's, it's actually the commas in between the elements that make it a tuple, not the, not the, the, the brackets, uh, the parentheses as opposed to a list that requires the brackets. That is, that is what makes it a list. Um, so the, the, the thing that sets it apart is, is, is uh, just the commas. So now this is a, a tuple. And if I try to do any of the things that, that I was just doing, uh, like if I try to append a new tuple to this sequences, that's not gonna work uh, because there is no append method. Uh, I can't change anything. Uh, once a value has been set in a tuple, it's, it's immutable. So this is actually really useful. And, and in a lot of uh, languages that have tuples, these are often used to represent structures. Um, so for instance, imagine I have some sort of a, a sequence structure that has an ID, like you, know, you, you download some sequences from GenBank, and each one of those sequences has an ID and a sequence. And, uh, and so I could represent that, for instance, with, you know, they're both strings, uh, so the ID is just this, you know, random mix of numbers and letters that came from some sequencing center. And then the sequence is the second thing, which is some string of DNA. Um, and, and if I, uh, it's, it's useful to create that as a name tuple because I don't want that data to ever be accidentally changed in my program. Um, I can create this, this little helper uh, called a named tuple that uh, allows me to talk about the field. So instead of talking about the zeroth field or the first field, I can instead talk, talk about the ID and the sequence, which is a lot, uh, a nicer way to talk about that. And, and I can do that by using this function called name tuple. And I can say that, you know, I will use this, fun this name called sequence and inside it's gonna have two fields that are ID and sequence. Um, and, and so when I use that, I've created this thing called, it's basically a type. I've created a new type, just like we have integer types and float types. I just created a new type inside Python called sequence. And that represents this structure that has two fields, an ID and a sequence. Um, and, uh, and the point of being able to use it is that in code, I can start to write this now, uh, where I have this sequence one with, this, with these values. And I can, and this is how I could reference the, the fields by their positions, but that's really ugly. This actually is a lot nicer to be able to talk about sequence.id. And that um, if you come from R, this is something that I will never forgive R for, is that they allowed the dot to be used just as part of a variable name. Um, and, and it's such an important uh, uh, piece of punctuation. I can't believe they let it go. Um, but in most every other language, the dot allows you to uh, basically call a method on an object. So uh, I'm, I'm referencing the seek ID. Whoops, I did not want that. I'm referencing the seek, I, the seek one object and then the ID field that belongs to it. And, and using that, I can create this, this string. And that's a lot nicer and it looks prettier. And, and actually it's a lot easier to check this kind of code. Um, but um, I can go a little bit further by using this, uh, this, this module called name uh, typing and in it, it has something called a name tuple and I can create that same uh, structure, but I can describe it now using type. So I can say that there's an ID that has a type string and there's the, the what I was showing you from earlier that the way to use the type and the way to create the type annotation is to put a colon and then the type from Python and this type can be types that you create too, which is, makes it really, really powerful. Uh, so I'm saying that there's gonna be this, this structure called a sequence that has these two fields of these two types. And, and the boy, this seems like, you know, that's gonna be really useful. And, uh, and, and uh, well, I do not like the way that that is, let me see. Okay, so I, I have these types, I'm trying to go through here and, uh, and I can still instantiate them the same way. Um, uh, but here's the problem. So let's say I try to create a sequence here and I say the sequence is gonna be equal to 3.14. And so you would think that Python would say, well, no, that you told me that needs to be a string. And so I won't do that. 
but no, Python will just go right ahead and create that for you. And sequence is 3.14. And I can verify that the type of that sequence is a float in violation of the thing that I told it that I wanted it to be. So you're like, well, well then, then how does that help me? Well, it, it, it doesn't help us in the REPL. But if I add this kind of information to my program, then it starts to become very helpful because I can use MyPy to check these kinds of things. So I told you all that so I can go back to my code and look at the mistake that I made. So I created this, this, this class to represent the arguments to my program. And I said, well, there's a positional, there's something called positional, there's something called string, there's something called int arg, there's something called file. And, and I described it with these different uh, uh, types. And, and so down here, you know, I changed this thing to p value. Uh, and then I went down here and I changed the, the int arg to p value. But then when I tried to run it, you saw that it said that there is no attribute int. Um, and it told me line 61. And then I was like, well, what's going on line 61? Ah, because I hadn't changed that to, uh, to, to be the name of this. And, and so here I'm trying to instantiate my args using the arguments that I've been given. But here I need to change the, this to p value. And that is of a type float. So as I'm you know, changing my program, I'm updating the arguments and then I get type checking. And so let me go back and run this. And now my, my program works correctly. And if I were to try to you know, give uh, you know, anything that's you know, not that, it's gonna say invalid float value. Okay, uh, I'm gonna pause for just a moment. Uh, are there any questions? I'm gonna drink some water. If the helpers would let me know if there are any questions. Yeah, no questions in the chat that I can see. Okay, so I'm going to modify this program now to be what the actual DNA program needs to be. There's only one uh, one argument we need, and it's going to be the positional one. But positional is just not a good name. Uh, it's going to be DNA. That that is that's the argument that we're being given, and it is a string. And so uh, the only thing I need to do here, the only value I need is DNA. Uh, and that's going to be what I call it here is, is going to be the way that I access the value to from, from argpar. So I'm going to change the metavar from stra, which is not very informative, to DNA. And, and, I'll, and I'll update the help. And I'll say, you know, input DNA sequence. I don't need any of the other arguments. Uh, one, one other thing actually I meant to, to mention here, um, don't really have time to cover this, but this type of a file type, uh, argparse will validate a uh, file. So if you, if, if, I, if you try to give an argument that's not actually a file, and, and specifically here I'm saying it has to be a readable text file, that's what R is for, readable, and T is for text. So if I were to, for instance, give it a file that I don't have permission to read, uh, argparse would stop and say, nope, I can't read that file, it's invalid. And that's really important because you, you want to validate those kinds of things right away and not wait for some you know, program you know, function deep inside the bowels of your program to try to open the file and then fall over. Uh, you need to validate these kinds of things immediately. Uh, so I don't need these arguments. I'm gonna get rid of them. Don't need that P value or this. Um, so the only thing I'm gonna do is, is parse the arguments and I'm going to return DNA. And just to get started, I'm going to get rid of all of this. And I'm going to print args.dna. Let me verify that this runs. I want that to get out of the way. Okay. I'm going to verify this runs. It does compile. And if I run it, it without any arguments, it tells me that one argument is required, it's DNA. If I give it some DNA, like, you know, ACGT or GT, it prints that. And it, let's say I give it two, uh, two values. That's not allowed either. So when I gave it zero arguments, zero positional arguments, it, it didn't allow me to run because it needs one. When I gave it one, it ran. When I gave it two, it did not run because it said, wait, I don't know what to do with this other argument that you gave me. You know, for instance, I could also say, 
uh, dash P is four, you know, 4.2. Um, again, it's going to be like, great, uh, but I don't know what dash P means. You, you know, that's, that's illegal. And so in this way, with, with actually writing very little code, I've created a, a fairly uh, rigorous interface to my program that's only going to allow in one argument. Now, of course, it could be, uh, you know, it could be garbage. You know, uh, actually, I can't use, uh-oh. Sorry, I'm used to my command line. I can't use, uh, I, I, can, I can input that. There's no verifying that it's actually valid DNA up to this point, but it, it does have to be a single string that my program gets. I hope that I'm not just like beating a dead horse here, but I hope that you can really see the value to this. Most scientific programs don't even rise to this level of like verifying that their arguments are correct. Um, so does anyone, does, does hopefully everyone see the utility in, in creating a program with this kind of structure? Okay. Um, all right, so now let's talk about like how do you, uh, how could you, count the, the bits in a, in, a, in a program. So that's, that's what's going on here. We're talking about um, uh, getting the input uh, from the command line. Um, uh, the next thing is that when you go to solve a program, uh, solve the problem at, at Rosalind, uh, and let me just pull up Rosalind again, um, you're going to be shown, uh, shown a sample data set like this, and, and you're going to write a program. And, and you see here that that, that I, it, wow, 2014, that was when I first solved this, um, that um, eventually I, I got it correct. And so if I wanted to, to download this data set, it's going to be downloaded as a, uh, as a text file. And it's, it's going to, I'm going to put it into my, my, uh, my downloads directory. And so uh, if I look at that file, it's under my downloads and it's called Rosalind DNA, you see it, it's a much larger string. Uh, so that I don't have to take that string and paste it onto the command line, I'd like to write this program so that it will read the DNA either as a command line argument or from a, a file name if I give it a file name. So let me just show you real quick. If you've, if you've never written Python, you might be curious how to do that um, and, and, and where you might do that. I'm actually going to put the code here inside git args because I just feel like it's part of getting the arguments to the program. So um, I'm going to say if args.dna, which is, uh, you know, that's where I'm going to find the argument for the DNA. I want to find out if that is a file. So there's a, a function called ospath.isFile. And that's going to return true or false if this thing is a file. So if that's a file, I'm going to set args.dna equal to opening args.dna and reading it. And then I'm going to rstrip. Uh, which will strip off any uh, any uh, white space on the right hand side. So strip from the right hand side. That's R strip. Um, and I'm just going to overwrite what's on the left with what's on the right. So Python has a way of, of allowing you to do this because it's going to evaluate what's on the right hand side of the equal sign. And once that's okay, it's then going to assign that to the left hand side. So it, it's kind of weird that you can do this in some languages wouldn't allow you to, but uh, Python is fine to do this. Um, and in doing that, now I can run DNA uh, with, you know, something like that, or I can run it with, uh, you know, the file that I just downloaded. Uh, let's see. Oh, let's see, I must've done something wrong. Oh, I must not have saved it. Let's try that again. Oh, OS, OS is not defined. Okay, so good. Uh, it's not defined because I need to bring in that module. And so I go up here to import, import OS. And let me run that again. Okay, so that is the input either from the command line or from a text file. Are there any questions so far? So that bit of code, it could have, this could have been put into the main function. Um, I just, I typically handle that in Git args because it's, a, it's just a common pattern that I use. Um, so uh, now I have a string of DNA and I need to count all the bases. So um, let me step back for a moment and start talking about testing. So I have written, uh, let's see, where are the, all the files? 
Um, there we go. Okay, so inside there's a test directory, uh, and you'll see that there are a bunch of input files, input one. So if we look at that, it's a small text file that has just a few bases, one A, two Cs, three Gs, four Ts. Uh, so if I were to run that, I would expect to see the output one, two, three, four, separated by spaces. Um, input two is a slightly longer one. That's the, that's the example string from, from the Roslyn page. And input three is just a much longer data set that I downloaded at some point. Um, and I have also written this file called DNA underscore test.py. And let me just show you for a moment. If I run PyTest, just, just PyTest, this is what I see. Uh, and I encourage you to do this if you're following along. Um, what's happening is that PyTest is going through the current directory and it's looking for any files that look like they might contain tests. So uh, if the file name begins with test underscore or ends with underscore test, then it's going to look inside that file. Inside that file, it's going to look for functions that start with test underscore, and it's going to execute those as tests. Um, and this first one tests that the program actually exists. So if we look at what PRG is here, up here at the top, I've, I've defined that PRG, the program that I'm testing, is called DNA.py. And so it's just simply looking, does this program exist yet? Um, because the first step in all of these uh, exercises is to actually create the program. And, and I always encourage uh, the, the user to start them with new PY and, and get them running. So that's always the first step. Um, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. And then the next one is that it actually runs your program with dash H and dash dash help. It's going to get the, it's going to run the program and get the status of the program and the output. So I need to talk for a moment here about the, the status of a program. And this is very important in bioinformatics. Let me go to a command line again. And if I say uh, echo, hello, echo is a program that just simply echoes back um, whatever it's been given. So if I say echo, hello, it will, it will print hello to me. In addition, it's signaled to the operating system its exit status. And I can see that in bash by looking at the special variable question mark, which is, it's kind of like saying, hey, how did that go? And, and I do that and it, and it reports the, the number zero uh, because it, uh, weirdly enough on, in systems programming, this, the output of zero means basically zero errors. So zero is uh, positive, that's thumbs up, it, it worked correctly. If I were to say, you know, when I ran Chamad without any, uh, without enough arguments, if I look at the exit status from that, you'll see it's not zero because I didn't give Chamad the correct arguments. And so it exited with an error value uh, just to tell me that, that it wasn't okay. The fact that it's one is not necessarily indicative of any particular error. Uh, sometimes programs will, will print, uh, will use an exit status of, you know, like, you know 126 to mean, you know, uh, database not found or something like that. Usually, uh, it, it does, the, the exit status doesn't mean anything at all, other than the fact that it wasn't zero. So when a, a, a well-behaved command line program exits uh, without, without problems, it should report zero. In any other situation, it re should report not zero. So told you that because here I'm running the I'm running the program with dash H and I'm looking at that return value and the output that it printed. And that is comes from this this function called get status output, which comes from this uh, module called subprocess. So subprocess allows me to run programs, other programs on my system and look at the output. Now, this in and of itself might be something that's really important for you to know. In, in whatever kind of analyses you're doing, because a lot of times what we're doing is taking some program that someone else has written, trying to execute it with our data, and then you know get the output of that, usually massage it to put it into some other little program that's gonna do the next step. Uh, and that's an analysis pipeline. That's just you know bread and butter for what we do. So if you were just wondering how in Python can I run some other program that exists on my machine, this is how you do it. Uh, in addition to, uh, Running the program, you can also verify that the program exited with a zero value by looking at the return value. 
So RV here means return value and out is the output that was printed by the program. And I'm using this assert statement, which again, if you're coming from like C, that should look familiar. So assert wants its argument to be true. So I'm saying RV equal equal to zero. That is a way in Python of, of comparing two things for equality. So you've also seen here, the single equal sign is used for assignment. So the output from this is assigned to RV and out. Here, the equal equal is a way of saying, is it true that RV is the same as zero? Um, so if this assertion fails, like for instance, because, um, you know, uh, just the program wasn't syntactically correct, then the return value from trying to run it would be non-zero. And so this assertion would fail. In addition, I'm looking at the output. I'm gonna lowercase it. And then I'm gonna say, is it true that it starts with the word usage? Uh, and so if that runs correctly, then uh, if, this assert if both of these assertions uh, pass for both of these flags, then this tests pass. Uh, and so what, what's happening here is PyTest is running each one of these. And crucially, it's running them in the order that they are defined in the file. So it starts with the first one, and then goes to the second one, then goes to the third one. And it's possible to have PyTest just stop testing as soon as it encounters a, uh, a failing test, which is what I usually recommend people to do. And that's the, the flag dash X to say stop testing. So for instance, if the, fi if the file doesn't exist, then there's no point in trying to run any of the other tests. So if I run dash X, it stops um, on this first F, which is the failing test. Um, I also like to run it uh, with verbose mode. Um, and those are two short flags and they can be given in any order. And uh, oh, they can also be squished together as dash uh, XV or dash VX, it doesn't matter. Uh, but the V stands for verbose and the X stands for um, uh, stop on the first failing test. So when I do that, I get a little more uh, output. And what what's it's showing me here that it passed the first test, it passed the usage, it passed the dying on no arguments. So if we look at that, that, that function, it simply runs the program with no arguments. And it expects that now the return value is not zero. And this is really important because let me go back to the command line and show you, um, I can use, I can chain things together on the command line. So if I say like echo, uh, 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 hello and echo uh, world. Uh, so the, the double ampersand is a way of saying this and this thing, but only if the first thing is true. So it, it, it's like your truth tables and discrete structures. Uh, so if the first thing, if echo hello succeeds, then echo world will, uh, will, will, will go forward. And you know, if I go back and I say chmod and echo hello, um, the, re, the, the output of that is not the, ex, the output from, from, from the, the failing chmod and then hello. The problem is that the, the chmod failed. And so the echo hello should never be executed. Um, and that's exactly what happens. When I try to and these things, the first thing is essentially false. So a false and a true is false. Uh, that's the way and works. And so when you're chaining together programs on the command line, if you have a program that reports a non-zero exit value, then that should tell the whole thing to stop. And, and uh, I have a, a, an appendix in the book on make files and make files do the same thing. Make files are a way for you to describe a workflow, an analysis workflow. And built into that is that if one of the, one of the steps fails by reporting a non-zero exit value, then the whole make, the whole workflow stops. And that's important because you need these things to fail uh, when you know, an input is bad or a disk fails or a database is not available. You, you're going to have to fix these problems manually and then restart your analysis. You would like to have some assurance that if the analysis actually completes, that all the steps in the middle were done correctly. Uh, otherwise, you have to you know, manually verify these things and then go back and rerun it. And that's, that's no fun at all. Uh, so does that make sense about the exit value from a program and how that uh, affects chaining it with other programs on the command line? Are there any questions about that? Uh, there seems think. to be a question on the chat. Uh, Ryan okay. is asking, is this command line behavior that you are describing fundamental to test in CICD? Yeah, yeah. So CICD, uh, continuous integration, continuous development. Is that right, Ryan? Um, 
Uh, yes. Uh, so if if you were, um, and and Ryan and I were on a uh, briefly on a project together, um, and and uh, continuous deployment. Yeah. Um, uh, w it's possible, like for instance, in GitHub, which I I I, I introduced at the beginning. If you're working on a, on a project with a lot of different developers, it's possible to have test suites to be run when people push code back to GitHub. And that is a way of continuously uh, integrating people's changes into uh, whatever analysis that you're trying to build, whatever you're trying to do as, as a team. And, and you, you want to continuously test that everything is working. And, and a lot of times in, in multi-developer uh, projects, uh, you're not allowed to integrate new code that doesn't have tests that verify that it does what it's supposed to do. And, and, that's, and that's essentially what we're talking about here. And, and these tests um, are really just really incredibly crucial to, to writing programs that essentially don't suck, which is what we have mostly in bioinformatics nowadays uh just you know software that was written by by students and postdocs who were never given any training whatsoever in software development who generally work on something for a couple of years and then leave to go you know to their phd program or to their next gig and then nobody maintains these things and 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 that's just not the world we want to live in um so yes it's it, it this this is fundamental command line behavior that you should understand that was honestly never explained to me. Uh, and I just kind of figured this out like, oh, like that's why that's a really important. And, and it just makes a lot of sense. All right, so let me go back to, to this. So uh, that is why here, when I run the program with no arguments, I expect that the return value should not be zero. And this is crucial. Um, and, and, and that behavior is entirely handled for me by argparse. I don't have to run that. I describe to argparse that I require one argument, it must be the string. And if, if, if the user gives me anything other than that, argparse takes care of it, shuts down the script, reports a non-zero uh, status, prints a nice useful error message, and I get all that behavior for free just by using the standard module. Okay, so uh, essentially, uh, for for this whole for all the tests in the repository, if you use new new py to start your program and 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 you get it to work correctly, uh, you're going to pass the first two or three tests every single time, uh, just simply because it's just verifying that your program is 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 decently well behaved. Um, okay, so um, now we're getting to the part where it's dying on this test argument. It's, this is failing, and the reason is is because it is uh let, let's look at the test itself it's opening there's a file and that has the dna and then there's some expected value so these test one test two test three these are, are defined right here they're tuples we talked about tuples earlier so it, if i run the if i run the program with this input file i expect that the output should be one two three four now this this may seem like uh really simple and I hope it does seem simple because at, at its essence, testing is very simple. You run your program with known input and you verify that it creates known output. That, that's, that's all there is to it. So if I give this input file, I expect this output. And what's going on here is that I'm, I have this file and this expected value. I'm putting this DNA, I'm opening that file and I'm reading it, which is the, the same code that I showed you just a bit ago. And I'm running the program with that as the argument from the command line. And I'm asserting first off that the return value from running that is zero and that there, and that also the output from the program is what I expected. Are there any questions on that? So that's a test and that's a really good test. Our, you know, our program expects, you know, DNA input and should print this output. And we just verified that. So what's going on here is that the output um, uh, was uh, AC. It, it was it was the, the the contents of the text file ACC G G G T T T T, and and it's that is what it's printing right now. And what it should have printed, what was expected, is one two three four. So we need to go back over here, and instead of printing args.dna, we need to print the correct number of you know one two three four. So that is the basis now for what we're trying to do. We're now trying to solve the test suite. Uh, and, and this is essentially, you may hear the term specs, 
uh, you know, so especially if you're working with a you know professional software developer, they'll say, well, I, you know, I'm supposed to write this program. What are the specs? Well, this is the, these are the specs, the specs, the specifications. I give this input, I expect this output. So uh, I'm going to go back to the text now, and and let's talk about uh, and this this is talking about all of that that I was just explaining about the return value and and, and what the tests uh, mean and what they're doing. And so now let's talk about how do we iterate and count the characters in a string. So if you're new to Python, this this may seem really weird. It certainly seemed weird to me. Um, uh, we can. Uh, uh, well, the first thing is that I'm going to show you an extremely basic way of doing this, and then we're going to, uh, once we solve the test suite, we're going to look at other ways to solve this. Um, so the first thing that I can do is establish four variables that counts for A, C, G, and T. Now, there's a lot of different ways that I could have count, uh, could have uh, have uh, have called these these variables. Um, depending on on your background, you might like to call it count uh, uppercase A. Or, or maybe you start off with a, a, an uppercase uh, 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 character, or maybe you like to use all uppercase, which is actually the way I write bash for some reason. Or you might uh, put an underscore there and then capitalize the A. Um, there is, uh, uh, going back to the, the Zen of Python that, that's mentioned in the, in the preface, Python programmers, as a rule, like for there to be one obvious way to do things. And there is a style guide for writing Python code. It's called PEP8. Um, that stands for something Python. I can't remember. You can look it up. But they're, they're numbered sequentially. And PEP8 is the style guide. And it says that function and variable names should be lowercase with words separated by underscores as necessary to improve readability. So that's what I use. And I feel like it's, it's crucial. I, I write in a number of different languages from Rust to Elm um, uh, and, and, and Python and Perl and Bash. And doesn't it, whatever language I'm using, I adopt the, the style of the community for writing that code. So where they like to put their braces and how they like to indent things and the way they name their variables, I go along with the flow because when another Python programmer is reading my code, I don't want there to be any like uh, anything that throws them off. They'll be like, whoa, this is obviously a Java programmer, you know, writing Python code. I don't want them to think that. I just want it to look like idiomatic Python. So uh, I always stick with these naming conventions. So uh, there's two different ways I could establish these four variables. I could write them all individually on individual lines, or I can use this, uh, this, this version, which is basically creating four tuples on each side. I'm creating a four tuple on the right side and then assigning it to four values on the left side, um, which uh, is a pretty convenient way to do this. So I'm going to take that code um, and I'm going to paste it here. So I just created four variables, count A, C, G, and T, and initialize them to zero. And again, in Python, we have to initialize a variable in order to use it. You can't just declare a variable and it be kind of undefined uh, value. So now that we have these initialized, I can now iterate over the characters in DNA. Um, in some languages, you know, DNA is a string and there would be some sort of a method that you would call to like get the characters out of it. That when I came to Python, that's exactly what I was used to doing in Perl and I was looking for that. And then I found that the idiomatic way in Python to do this is to use a for loop. And I'll call it, I could call the, 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 the variable that's gonna hold each base. I could call it whatever I want. I could call it char for character. I'm gonna call it base because that's what it is. For base in args.dna. And then I'm just going to print that. Um, let me fix this for a second. And I'm going to print the base. And then I want to talk about a couple of things about Python syntax that may be new to you. So um, each character in, in args.dna is going to be put into base. Uh, and, and, and then uh, uh, this colon, the colon at the end is a way of in other languages that use uh, curly brackets, you would put the block in curly brackets that, that follows this for loop. In Python, you introduce a block with, with uh, semicolons. And, and you're, letting the, you're letting the compiler know that what follows is a block of code. And the way to indicate that block of code is by indentation. Um, it, it, it's, if you're going to indent with tabs, you're a fundamentally bad person but you must do it consistently and use tabs everywhere. 
Uh, the morally upright way to indent code is with spaces only. And uh, typically it's four spaces. It's possible to indent with you know, only one or two or three, as long as you're consistent, but you would then be again you know, uh, in moral turpitude. So indent only with four spaces. And, uh, and all the block, everything that's indented to the same level is at the same, uh, is in the same block. Uh, that's crucial to Python. Um, some people hate white space dependent languages uh, and some people love them. The thing that I would say is that it's fine because I almost never manually uh, format my code. I use code formatters that do this for me. And I just simply let them format however, uh, you know, it wants to do it. There's two, there are two of them that are very popular. One's called Black. Uh, it takes its name from Henry Ford, who said that you could have a Model T in any color as long as it's black. Uh, so you, you basically get very little choice over how Black will format your code. And the one that I tend to use is YAPF, which is yet another Python formatter, which came out of Google. For a long time, Google, uh, Python was one of their main languages. Uh, they've since replaced that with a language called Go that, that they created for themselves. Um, so this is how I'm going to iterate over this. And if, if there's no point in running the test suite right now, I know this is going to fail. It's not doing the right thing. So instead, I'm just going to run the program with like ACGT. And what I verify is that it is printing each of the bases. Um, and, I, and I can double check that with, you know, uh, the tests input, uh, what did I call it, input one. And if I, if I use it with an input file, it doesn't matter. It's reading the DNA from two different sources and it's iterating over it. Uh, so are there any questions so far? So, you know, what I'm stressing here is uh, essentially how to create new variables uh, and how to iterate over characters in a string. Um, helpers, let me know if there are any chat because I can't see that. Okay, thank you. And uh, the for loop is 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 really really used a ton in in Python, which is very different, uh, as I understand from from R. R is a much more vectorized based language, uh, and in fact, for loops are are pretty notoriously slow, as I understand. Um, oh, actually, actually, I can see the chat. What is it? Why can I see that now? Okay, cool. Uh, okay, in this example, indenting print will return different results. And not, yeah, yes, because if I don't indent the print, then it's not, uh, then it's no longer in, it's at the same level as the four. So it's not actually belonging to the block of the for loop. Uh, so crucial that you get this right. And if I indented two spaces, actually, uh, let's just see what the, the result is. Uh, oh, okay, that seems to be okay with that. Um, I'm still going to make it four. Um, so uh, what was I just saying? Oh, we're just trying to, uh, oh, I was going to say about for loops. Uh, I, I understand that, that R tends to not use for loops a lot, uh, whereas they're extremely used in Python. And there's, you can use for loops over anything that is in a sequence. So the characters in a, in a, in a string are items in a sequence. Uh, elements in a list, I, I showed that earlier. Uh, I, I showed name tuples, that, that's, a, that's a, another kind of list. You can iterate over each of the values in a tuple. You could iterate over all the lines in a file. You could iterate over all the records returned by an SQL query. Uh, so for loops are just used uh, in, a, in a ton of places. Um, so that's how we iterate. Now the question is, we need to count the character bases now. So it, the goal is not to print them, but it is, is to count them. So how, how can we do that? I'm going to create a, a, a basically a decision tree. I'm going to say if base is equal to uh, a, then uh, and I say that with a, a colon. And again, so I'm I, I'm now creating another level. Uh, when I indent, when I hit enter in MVS Code, it automatically indents because of the the colon. It sees oh you you must want a new block of code, and so I'm going to make count a go up by one. So I could say that count A is equal to count A plus one. Um, and, 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 uh, and that's one way to do this. But we, we do this sort of thing so often that there's actually a special operator for doing that. And it's the plus equal operator. And, and probably most of you have seen this from other languages. Um, if there's any, any, any question about that, what's happening is that count A is going to be is going to go up by the value that's on the right hand side. So I'm adding one to it. 
Uh, if you come from C++ or C, you might be used to the unary operator plus plus, um, which can go sometimes before or after. I know Perl did this. Uh, Python does not have the plus plus operator. It's, there there are, are very few unary operators. So it's plus equal one. So I have to handle this for all of the other ones. And the way that we spell else if in Python is elif. So elif base is equal to C. Then I want count at C to go up by one. And I just have to do this for all four bases. Base is equal to G, uh, count G plus equal to one. Ooh. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say elif to, to, if I said else count uh, T goes up by one, then it, it could be any other character. And, and I, I, so I really want to make sure that the base is actually equal to T. So count of T is plus equal to one. Uh, and, and that is it. Um, and you notice, so without having uh, brackets, there's, there's, it's one of the things I kind of don't like about white space dependent languages is I can't jump to like the other bracket, the matching bracket to get to the end of a, of a block of code. But that's how we, I, I essentially enter those blocks in, into Python. Are there any, any questions about how I typed that, uh, the syntax for that? So finally, we actually should have a working program now. If I say, uh, I'm going to show you one way to print the results. Um, I'm going to say print that. So print can take more than one argument and will by default, you put a space in between each of those values. So if I run this now, it prints one, 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 one. Let me run it with the input file. It prints one, two, three, four. This looks promising. This should pass my test suite. So I can say pytest, oh, pytest dash XV. Yay. Uh, that is a fully passing test suite. And so to an extent, we're done. Uh, you just learned test-driven development and, and, and that's cool. And, you, and hopefully you learned a few things about, about Python and command line programs and things like that. But um, really that's, that's just the first step. Like, like we, we, now we have a working program. We know one way to count all the bases. Uh, I actually, if you look over here, uh, have seven different ways uh to count them and so uh and the the point of exploring all these other ways is is to uh is to see what else we can do with python because this is an extremely verbose uh solution that's very very much like you would write something in c but there are a lot lot shorter ways to write this in python that use some things that are unique to the language uh so i'm going to take a, a a moment here to see if there are any questions uh about what i've done so far because i don't want to go forward unless unless you're cool with this yes so someone is, is pointing out that uh r is not white space dependent and oh my god can i tell because i've had to look at some r code where people just don't put spaces um uh, you can put spaces is where you want or not put them and it just I mean, people talk about Perl being unreadable. I've I've seen some R that is is just it's it's unfathomable. Um, and there, the, the nice thing though, uh, there's hope. There are formatters. Uh, in fact, I think one of the programs is called Formatter, right? And they like the in in R, they like to just put R on the end of things, dplyr and things like that. So there's Formatter. Uh, I, I think I've looked at a couple. Um, there's also a, a way to uh, create command line programs in R that validate command line arguments, just like the very, very similar to R parse, not quite as nice. Um, and, and on the, the program that I was working, yes, Ryan points out Lintar, uh, uh, Linter works pretty nice. And uh, really, really important, I think, if you're working, even if you're just working by yourself, you should use these tools to format your code because it will make it more readable, make it easier to maintain your code, to share it with other people. If you're working on, on a project with other people, there, there are these things that we call religious wars in, in, uh, in, in programming, like Vim versus Emacs. There's no right answer. Um, I use Vim. I've used it for like 20, 20 years. Um, I love it. But if you prefer using Emacs, who, who cares? As long as you get the, the, the job done. When it comes down to, to to formatting code, you know, like do you do you cuddle your braces or do you put them on the other line? 
you know, who wants to fight a war about that? Let, let's just use a formatter that will format everyone's code the same way and, and just get used to it. Um, and so I, I highly encourage you to adopt formatting stuff, to adopt standard modules like arg parse to, to do these things, because there, there's a lot more important things to worry about. Um, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to, take this this example and and i'm going to go back to the book for a moment so uh we go through through here this this is how oh i point out um you know this is how i i'm printing this this version i'm pointing out that that this is controlled by this argument called sep so if i wanted to put double colons in between them i would just say sep equals double colon so if you want to alter this behavior with print this is how you do it uh, there's also a, a, an end variable uh, and so uh, here uh, you can put you know uh, dash 30 dash uh, i was in my high school newspaper if you can't tell so um if you want to know more about these kinds of functions uh go into your repl i think this is one of the best things about the repl and you can say help print and it will show you the documentation for the print function uh, and those things are all spelled out right here so uh here's the separator here's the end there's another one called flush and something called file which which i explain later in the book as well so uh, a lot of really great documentation available to you inside the REPL. okay um uh the next thing is is is, is i want to go a little farther with the testing um so so far we've just been running the tests that are in that DNA test uh, dot .py. Um, but there's other tests that we can incorporate too that, that verify that our, our program has linted correctly and that our types are being uh, uh, run properly too. And so uh, I mentioned this in the requirements document that I, that I talked about at the beginning. These should have all been installed for you. In addition to PyLint and Flake 8, there's the way to integrate them into PyTest, so PyTest PyLint. Um, and if I run, so this is what I've been running so far is py, pytest.xv. If I've installed the pylint and flake8 and, my, and mypy extensions, I can actually run it like this and it will incorporate extra tests for me, basically ones that it creates on, on the fly. So notice here, uh, there's what, five tests. Here I'm going to run, uh, and it's going to create a couple of extra tests. It ran flake eight here and it skipped because it just didn't find anything to check. Uh, MyPy ran uh, and passed. Uh, and so it, it essentially created two new tests for me to make sure that my, my program was formatted correctly and that I was using my types correctly. Um, that is really, really helpful. And uh, so, but that's a lot to type every time you want to type it, uh, every time you want to run the test. So I have created something, uh, I, I've added in every single directory, there's something called a make file. Um, and I have a whole appendix, uh, the first appendix in the book uh, spends a few pages trying to explain what make is and what a make file does. Uh, but, but essentially it's a way of creating a little shortcut. In, in, when I run make in this directory, uh, and I give it and I say make test, it's going to look for the existence of a file called make file, either uppercase or lowercase. And it's gonna see this, this thing called a target or a recipe uh, that needs to be flush left and it ends with a colon. And then all the commands that it executes must be indented with a, with a tab. Uh, absolute requirement has to be a tab. Um, the story I was told is that the guy who created this uh, he realized that he really would would prefer it to be spaces, but at that point he already had four users and he didn't want to break uh, their experience. So uh, so he kept it with tabs. Uh, Make has been around since 1976, so um, it, it, it's not quite as old as me. So if I say make test, it's going to run this command, which is actually you know quite a bit. So I run make test and it runs all that for me, and and it actually found a few other things uh, like it says hey you're importing text io but it's not being used it says there's too many blank lines uh, i mean it's pretty it's pretty uh, uh snippy about it so okay I, if i go get rid of text io i'm bringing in some code i don't need um if i go run make test again um it's still complaining about like some blank lines 
And normally if I was working in VEI, I would just put this through a code formatter and it would fix those things. But uh, those are good things to check repeatedly as you're, as you're developing. You want to verify that you know, your, your code is formatted and all those kinds of things. So uh, a make file is basically a way to create a shortcut. They can do a lot more than that. And I really encourage you to, to read about them. Um, uh, the next thing, I, I won't have time to go over all these, but the next thing I'd like to show you is how to create a unit test. So I want to take the code. Um, so what I've been showing you so far are what are called integration tests. So um, I have written these tests for you. They run the program from the outside the way your users will run it, and they verify your program does what it's supposed to do. Um, as you're developing code, you're going to want to write small functions that do a very limited number of things. Usually one is good. And then you want to write a test to verify that that function does what it's supposed to do. Um, so for instance, uh, I can't remember what I called it in the book, um, but all of this code right here belongs in a function. And in Python, I can create a function by using the, the function called def. And I'll just call it count. And uh, for the moment, I'm just going to paste this code. So this is all the code that I that I just uh, that I just uh, was executing, and uh, actually, you know what? Let me stop this for a second. I'm going to go back to the way it was. Okay, let me start over. I'm going to create a function called def count. It's going to take some DNA that's a string, and it's going to return a tuple. That is an int, an int, an int, and an int. And uh, I'm going to put a doc string, count DNA. And for the moment, I'm going to return 0, 0, 0, 0. OK, so what I've done here is I've essentially uh, made myself think about what this function is going to take and what it's going to return. Um, it, this is getting a little squiggly line because it doesn't know where tuple is. I need to import tuple. This is a type. OK. And I want to write a test for this thing. And in order to run it with PyTest, I need to call it test underscore something. So I'm going to call it test underscore count. The function is not going to take any arguments, and it's not going to return anything. So technically, it returns none. And I'm going to say this is going to test the count function. That's the doc string. And I'm going to assert that if I count the empty string, for instance, that it's going to return 0, 0, 0, 0. That is test-driven development. So I've, I've thought about a function that I want to write, and I write a, and I write a test for it. And, and if I, what's interesting is that I can run PyTest on this DNA.py. And what it does is it looks inside, let me, let me run it verbosely, dash V. It looks inside the DNA.py program, finds the function called test count, and runs it. And right now, I'm passing count an empty string, and I'm expecting to get back 0, 0, 0, 0. And, and that works because that's, that's the only thing the function does, right? Um, but I also want to verify, for instance, you know, if, uh, whoops, that if I uh, pass it the single string A, then it should return one in the first position. Uh, what is it? Uh, so let me, interesting. What is happening? OK, let me run PyTest on that. X, XV. Now it's not uh, working correctly because I'm passing at this, this, you know, this value, and I'm expecting to get back one, and it's always returning 0, 0, 0, 0. Uh, just to make that look nicer, I'm going to put that in parentheses. So essentially, I just need to take all of this code and move it into my function. So let me, this is something I don't like about IDEs. I don't like using the mouse. I'm going to paste my code in here, and now I'm going to return those counts. And now if I run this code, oh, 
sorry, uh, let's see, in arg, I'm still referencing args.dna. For the moment, I need to comment this out because that's not syntactically correct. Okay, now my function passes. So I just took all the code from main and I stuck it in a function now called count that takes DNA as an argument that must be a string and it's gonna return a tuple that has four integer values in it. And that's how I describe this using types. And uh, I've, I've moved all this code here. I've written uh, you know, one, uh, one assertion. Um, and actually there's, there's a bunch here. I'm just gonna go over here to the unit and I'm just gonna take all of these. This is, uh, these are some other assertions that I can paste in, whoops. And so if I run with the string one, two, three, X, Y, Z, I expect to get all zeros back because there's no, there's no DNA nucleotides. Uh, I, I'm checking here that if I just give one nucleotide, it puts it into the correct position. And here I've got you know, this string where there's one, two, three, and four of the different things. And if I run this, it passes. That is, that's, that, that's the basis of test-driven development. So you're gonna write a function and you're gonna write a test for it. And now, uh, now I can go back here and uh, and get, for instance, I'll change uh, I'll change the main code. I'm going to count args.dna, and then I'll print that value. So if I make test, uh, it's still unhappy about some blank lines and stuff. Um, let's just do pi test. The, the functions, the, the program still works. It, it should still work. I mean, I, I haven't really changed fundamentally how the program works. I just moved some code around. But the point about, uh, the point about this is that and I'm refactoring my code. So th the way I'm refactoring my code at the moment is I'm just organizing it better. Uh, for such a short program that do does just one thing, this seems like overkill. Uh, but, you know, a short program becomes a long program, becomes a much, much larger, longer program. Uh, and, and typically, I like to have a function only be uh, 50 lines of code or less. Like, I would like for it to be able to fit in, like, say, this amount of window. And if I have a function that goes on for hundreds and hundreds of lines, it's too long. It needs to be broken up into many, many smaller functions hopefully each of which will do just one thing. Uh, for instance, this function counts a string of DNA, returns a tuple, and I can write a test for it, and I can verify that this function works. And if I go, you know, change something, like let's say I, I, I accidentally type that wrong. If I go run this, um, my, my test suite no longer passes. Because, you know, it, it tells me right there, when I, when I ran it with you know, this value, I expected one, two, three, four, and I got one, two, three, zero. Um, and, and so that's, that's the kind of assurances that you start to get from, from test-driven development. Um, I think that I'm about out of time. I can't see my clock actually. Uh, no, I've got a few minutes left. Okay, so uh, are, are there any questions with that? Because now I'd like to show you just a, a couple of ways to write this in, much cooler. Okay, I'm just gonna check, nothing in the chat. Okay. All right, so um, it turns out this is a, a really, really long way to write this. Um, uh, th there's a much, much shorter way to, to, to write all of this code. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, again, I do not like using a mouse. I think that I can do, oh, there's an option here for commenting out, but I'm just gonna delete this code for the moment because it's all in another function that you know in these these other programs that you can look at it turns out that there is um uh i can return and so oh, this is also crucial to python some are uh some some programming languages will simply return the last evaluation the last statement the last expression from a function automatically but python will not you must use the return uh the return statement Otherwise, it will return none by, by default. So if you don't have a return statement in your function, the, the function does return something. It just returns the value none, which is written like that. 
Um, turns out I can do args. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, not args, but DNA dot count a. So that what this will do, and and it could be helpful to look at it in the uh, in the REPL here. Let's say the DNA is equal to ACTG, or how about a c? If I say DNA dot count the letter a, it finds four. Uh, it's also interesting if I say count AA, it, it finds two. So it, it finds a substring and they're not overlapping substrings. So it basically the count will look for how many times one string occurs inside another. So that one string can be a single base, uh, you know, a single character, or it could be some longer string. Uh, but so, uh, and, and what's nice about this is that it's safe to use, like if I try to count the T's, there are no T's and it returns zero. So I can therefore write this as count DNA, count uh, A, count C, DNA, count G, oops, G and DNA, count T. And this is what is nice about testing. If I run this, I verify that my program still works. And that's the point of writing functions is that once you, the, the function accepts some values, returns some values. What goes on inside is, is, is completely, it's a black box. You shouldn't know or care what goes on inside a function. Um, and so it allows me to have a test. The test doesn't care how the function is written. The test only cares, I give you this, you give me this. And uh, uh, I, I've read about you know young British children being taught this please and thank you game. So you don't get the cookie until you say please. And then when I give it to you, you say, thank you. There's the expectation, please and thank you. So that's our expectation here. I give you the empty string, you give me back four zeros. I give you back the letter A, you give me back one and three zeros. So it doesn't matter how I implement this. Uh, and all of a sudden I've gone from, what was that? Probably 10 lines of code down to one line of code. And, and there's actually even uh, shorter ways to solve this. Um, and and I, I'll let you, uh, I don't have time to go into like dictionaries, default dictionaries, uh, but I'll just show you here this last version uh, uses something called a counter, uh, which is a, a way of uh, creating a bag uh, or a multiset. Uh, and so I, I can show you from the command line, if I import from the collections module, uh, uh, oops, I have to say, sorry, from, from collections, uh, import something called counter. What's cool is I can say, uh, make a counter of the string AC, and it returns a dictionary that says, I found A three times, G two times, C one time, T one time. Uh, and so those are the kinds of modules that exist in Python. There's, there's many, many more to learn about. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing here, and I'm just going to look for uh, if there are any comments. Uh, yeah, I just want to, and I'll, you know, uh, that's essentially what I wanted to show you. Uh, so I have a whole book about this. You're welcome to read it for free. You can get it from the U of A library. Uh, uh, you're, you're welcome to share it with your lab mates. Uh, I'm probably going to be using this, uh, some of that material as well, well, a lot of that material in the BE434. So if you or anyone you know in your lab would like to learn more about how to write Python programs for doing data analysis, uh, uh, it is it is being printed right now. Uh, it, it, it actually went to the printer about a week and a half ago. Uh, so you could order it from Amazon and get, uh, uh, I'm a, I'm sorry to say it's $90. I didn't get to set the price, O'Reilly did. Uh, but if you want the dead, dead tree version, uh, you can order it from Amazon or you can uh, read it for free in the electronic version on the library site. Um, uh, and so, uh, yeah, I have a lot, a lot more to say about like how to write Python effectively. Uh, I, but the ideas that I've covered are applicable to any language that you use. So uh, again, Brian and I were on a, a uh, a project that last summer, uh, it was R based, and I was trying to introduce the idea of test driven development in this, this project that was entirely based on R. Um, it did not go well, uh, but uh, these ideas can be used with any, and they are used uh, industry wide, and, and there's no reason why test driven development should not be taught to beginners from the beginning. Uh, and, and used as a teaching tool and, and also just for you to understand your code better. I think that if you were to adopt these, uh, these techniques, again, no matter the programming language that you're working in, I think you'll find that you understand your code better and are able to write programs faster that work, that can be refactored and expanded. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's all my time. And if you 
Uh, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to read them in the chat. So um, I, I put in into uh, into the, uh, the 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 subject page. You know, you can reach me at kyclark at arizona.edu. Uh, my personal address is kyclark at gmail.com. Uh, kyclark at c-path.org. Um, and so uh, you can you can reach out to me if you have any questions. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to you know if you wanted me to come and just talk to your lab group about these kinds of ideas to introduce the book. Uh, to introduce these, uh, you know, or, or just to chat about how to to write code more effectively, I'd be happy to do that. All right, that's all my time, and I, I, I hope you enjoy the rest of ResPass. All right, thank you, Ken. I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>